Hello everyone, welcome. In this lecture, we are going to see what is cyber security and why cyber security is important. So now let's first understand what is cyber security. Cyber security is nothing but it is a primarily about people, processes and technologies working together to encompass the full range of threat reduction, vulnerability reduction, deterrence, international engagement, incident response, resiliency and recovery policies and activities including computer network operations, information assurance and law enforcement etc. Cyber security is a protection of internet connected systems including hardware, software and data from cyber attacks. It is made up of two words, one is cyber and the other one is security. Cyber is related to the technology which contains systems, networks and programs or data we can say. We are a security related to the protection which includes system security, network security and application and information security. It is a body of technology, processes and practices designed to protect networks, devices, programs and data from attacks, thefts, damage, modifications or unauthorized cases. Now, it may also be referred as information technology security. So, we can also define cyber security as a set of principles and practices designed to protect our computing resources and online information against threats. Due to heavy dependency on computers in a modern industry that stores and transmits an abundance of confidential and essential information about the people. Cyber security is a critical function and needed insurance of many businesses. That's very important. So the next question arises that why cyber security is important. We live in a digital era which understands that our private information is more vulnerable than ever before. We all live in a world which is networked together from internet banking to government infrastructures where data is stored on computer and other devices. A portion of that data can be sensitive information whether that particular intellectual property, financial data, personal information or other type of data for which unauthorized access or exposure could have negative consequences. So cyber attacks is now an international concern and has given many concerns that hacks and other security attacks could endanger the global economy. Organizations transmit sensitive data across networks and to other devices in the course of doing business. And cyber security describes to protect that information and the system used to process or store it. As the volume of cyber attack grows, Companies and organizations, especially those that deals information related to national security, health or financial records need to take a step to protect their sensitive business and personal information very seriously. So this is all about the introduction about cyber security. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you for watching this lecture. So welcome to new section. In this section, we are going to see what are cyber security goals. So the objective of cyber security is to protect information from being stolen, compromised or attacked. So cyber security can be measured by at least one of three goals. So the first one is protect the confidentiality of data, preserve the integrity of data, promote the availability of data for authorized users. These goals from the confidentiality, integrity, availability, CIA trade. So the basic of all security programs, the CIA trade is a security model that is designed to guide policies for information security within the premises of an organization or company. This model is also referred to as the AIC model, which is also called as availability, integrity and confidentiality trade. To avoid the confusion with the central intelligence agency, the element of the trade are considered the three most crucial component of security. The CIA criteria are one that most of organizations, companies uses when they have installed a new application, create a database or when guaranteeing access to the some data. For data to be completely secure, all of these security goals must come into effect. And these are security policies that all work together and therefore it can be wrong to overlook one policy. 
सो इन द नेक्स्ट लेक्चर वी आर गोइंग टू सी द फर्स्ट ट्रेड विच इज कॉन्फिडेंशियलिटी नाउ गाइस इन दिस लेक्चर वी आर गोइंग टू सी वॉट इज कॉन्फिडेंशियलिटी Confidentiality is roughly equivalent to privacy and avoids the unauthorized disclosure of information. It involves the protection of data, providing access for those who are allowed to see it while disallowing others for learning anything about its content. It prevents essential information from reaching the wrong person while making sure that the right people can get it. Data encryption is a good example to ensure confidentiality. so here we have some tools of confidentiality so now let's learn about them so the first one that we have here is encryption encryption is a method of transforming information to make it unreadable for unauthorized users by using an algorithm the transformation of data uses a secret key which is called as an encryption key so that the transformed data can only be read by using another secret key which is called as decryption key it protects sensitive data such as credit card number by encoding and transforming data into unreadable cipher code or cipher text this encrypted data can only be read by decrypting it and asymmetric key and symmetric key are the two main primary types of encryption so the next that we have access control what is access control access control defines rules and policies for limiting access to a computer system or a physical or a virtual resources it is a process by which users are granted access and certain privileges to system resources or information in access control systems users need to present credentials before they can be granted access such as person's name or computer serial number in physical system These credentials may come in many forms but credentials that cannot be transferred provide the most security so the next one that we have here is authentication what is authentication an authentication is a process that ensures and confirms a user's identity or role that someone has it can be done in a number of different ways but it is usually based on combination of something the person has something person knows something person is authentication is necessary for every organization because it enables organizations to keep their network secure by permitting only authenticated users to access its protected resources these resources may include computer system network databases websites or other network based applications or services okay so now we are having here is authorization so what is authorization authorization is a security mechanism which gives permission to do or have something it is used to determine a person or a system is allowed access to resources based on an access control policy including computer programs file services data application features it is normally preceded by authorization or authentication for users identity verification system administrators are typically assigned permission levels covering all systems and user resources during authorization a system verifies an authenticated users access rule and either granted or refuses resource access so last we are having physical security so what is physical security physical security describes measures designed to deny the unauthorized access of it assets like facilities equipments personal resources and other properties from damage it protects these assets from physically threat including theft vandalism fire natural disasters so these all are the parts of confidentiality in the next lecture we are going to see what is integrity thank you. now guys in this lecture we are going to see what is an integrity integrity refers to the method for ensuring that data is real accurate and safeguarded from unauthorized user modification it is the property that information has not be altered in an unauthorized way and that resources or sources of the information is zen so now let's talk about what are the tools of integrity 
So the first one that we have here is backups. So what is backup? Backup is a periodic archiving of data. It is a process of making copies of data or data files to use in the event when the original data or a data files are lost or destroyed. It is also used to make copies for historical purposes such as for longitudinal studies, statistics or for historical records or to meet the requirements of a data retention policy. Many applications, especially in a Windows environment, produce backup files using the .bak files extension. So the next one that we have here is checksums. So what is checksum? A checksum is a numerical value used to verify the integrity of a file or data transfer. In other words, it is a computation of function that maps for the content of a file to a numeric value. They are typically used to compare two sets of data to make sure that they are the same. A checksum function depends on the entire content of a file. It is designed in a way that even a small changes to the input file such as flipping a single bit likely to result in different output values. Okay, so the next one that we have here is data correcting codes. So what is data correcting code? It is a method for storing data in a such way that small changes can be easily detected or automatically corrected. So this is all about integrity. In the next lecture, we are going to see what is availability. So the next one that we have here is availability. Availability is a property in which information is accessible and modifiable in a timely fashion by those authorized to do so. Okay, so it is the guarantee of reliable and constant access to our sensitive data by authorized people. So the tool of availability that we have here is physical protections. So what is physical protections? Physical safeguard means to keep information available even in the event of physical challenges. It ensures sensitive information and critical information technology are housed in a secure areas. So the next one that we have here is computational redundancies. It is applied as fault tolerant against accidental faults. It protects computers and storage devices that serves as fallback in the case of failure. So these are the two tools that we have inside availability. So this is all about CIA trades. From the next lecture onwards, we are going to start new topic. So thank you for watching this lecture. Hi guys. Welcome to the first lecture of this course. In this first lecture, we are going to see what is VirtualBox and how we can download and install VirtualBox into our Windows operating system. So VirtualBox is a free open source cross platform application for creating, managing, running virtual machines. Virtual machines are computers whose hardware components are emulated by the host computer and you can set up one or more virtual machines on a single physical machine and use them simultaneously along with the actual machine. So each virtual machine can execute its own operating system including versions of Microsoft Windows, Linux, BSD and MS-DOS. So now let's see how you can download VirtualBox into your Windows operating system. So first you need to open your favorite web browser and in the search bar what you need to type VirtualBox. So when you hit enter, as you can see that we have this particular link which is virtualbox.org Oracle VM VirtualBox. So this is the official link for downloading VirtualBox. So just click on this particular link. Now this is the page which will download VirtualBox for us. So as you can see that this tab which is download VirtualBox 6.1. So this is the latest version of VirtualBox. So when you click on this particular tab it will open one more page for you all. So we have this page. What we are going to next is currently I'm using Windows host. So I'm going to download the virtual box by, for my Windows host. And if you're using OS X, so you will just click on this particular link and Linux and Solaris for this. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to download, download it for Windows. So when I click on this particular link, it will op pop up a window, which is saying that the file size is 103 MB and this is the setup of VirtualBox. 
So when you click on save file, it will start downloading your virtual box. So I have already downloaded it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open it for you all so that I can show you how you can install this particular operating system. Okay, virtual box. Now we have this particular window. So when you click on next, so it will show you the place where it's going to install. So if you want to change the place or paths, you can browse from here and you could change it. Now click on next. So these are the shortcuts that are going to be created when you click on yes. So when you click on yes, it will start installing VirtualBox into your Windows operating system or any other operating system. So this is how you can download VirtualBox and install VirtualBox into your operating system. In the next lecture, we are going to see how VirtualBox looks like and how to download and see Kali Linux into your VirtualBox. So this is all for this lecture. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you for watching this lecture. Now it's time to download Kali Linux operating system so that we can install that particular operating system into the virtual box. So what you need to do is you need to simply open a new tab and type here Kali Linux and hit enter. And after hitting enter, as you can see that we have this website, which is www.kali.org. So when you click on this particular link, it will open a new window for us, which is this. So here we'll find download training documentation community about us. So we are interested in downloads. So when you move your cursor towards downloads, you will see download Linux, Kali Linux, NetHunter, Kali Linux revealed book and release information. So we are going to click on download Kali Linux. So when you click on download Kali Linux, you will find these many links from which you can download Kali Linux. But for now we are using VirtualBox. So we are interested in VirtualBox version. So you will find it here. Kali Linux 64 bit VirtualBox. So when you click on this particular link, which is offensive security VM download page. So it will open a new page for us. And it will look like this. So we have two options here. The first one is for the virtual machine, which is here. And the second one is for the virtual box. So we are interested in virtual box. So when you click on this symbol, you will find these many options. We are having two options, the 64 bit operating system and for 32 bit operating system. But currently we are using 64 bit architecture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on torrent. So when you click on torrent, it will start downloading your file. Okay. So when you click on this particular OK button, it will start downloading in downloading your file. So now let's see in the next lecture how you can install Kali Linux operating system into the virtual box machine. So this is all for this lecture. Now in this lecture, we are going to download Meta Splatable 2. So the Meta Splatable 2 virtual machine is an intentionally vulnerable version of Ubuntu Linux designed for testing security tools and demonstrating common vulnerabilities. And the version 2 of this particular virtual machine is available for download and ships with more vulnerabilities that, uh, than the original image. Now let's see how we can download Meta Splatable 2 inside our Windows operating system. So what you need to do is you need to simply open your web browser and inside the search bar what you need to type is Meta Splatable 2. So when you hit enter you will find these kinds of links which is from SourceForge. So when you click on this particular first link, which is Meta Splatable, browse Meta Splatable 2 at SourceForge.net. So when you click on this particular link, it will open the downloading page for you. So in this, in this downloading file, there is two files, which is Meta Splatable Linux zip. And the next one is readme.txt. So when you click on this green tab, it will start downloading your Meta Splatable 2. So it will take some time because it is around 800 MB file. So as you can see that we have this file. So this is a zip version of this particular file. When you click on this OK button, it will start downloading. So this is how you can download Meta Splatable 2. Hi guys. In this lecture, we are going to download OWASP Broken Web Application Project. It is a collection of vulnerable web applications that is distributed on a virtual machine in VMware format compatible with their no-cost VMware player and VM 
where spear hypervisor so now let's see how we can download OWASP BWA so what you need to do is you need to type OWASP BWA OWA file and hit enter so after hitting enter you will find so many links so what you need to do is you need to click on this particular third link which is OSDN.net so when you click on this particular link you will find this particular page so when you scroll down you will see these files so what you need to do is you need to click on this particular file which is dot over okay so when you click on this particular file it will show you this kind of interface so when you click on this particular link which is OWASP broken web app vm so after clicking on this particular link you will find you are redirected towards the source files so it will start downloading your OWASP VWA so this is very large file it will take lots of time as you can see that it is 2.4 GB file okay so when you click on OK button it will start downloading okay so this is how we can download OWASP broken web app for the windows thank you for watching this lecture now from this lecture onwards we are going to install all our softwares inside the virtual box so what we are going to do is we are going to first install Kali Linux okay so we have downloaded Kali Linux successfully so just navigate to the folder where you have downloaded Kali Linux so as you can see that we have two files inside this particular folder so when you double click on this particular file which is first one so it will open the virtual box for us so as you can see that this is the place where we are going to install Kali Linux so when you click on import so when you click on import agree it will start importing your Kali Linux into the virtual box so it will take some time it is a bit of long process so just pause the video till the completion of this now the importing is been successful so for opening Kali Linux what you need to do is you need to simply navigate to Kali Linux and hit enter on start so after hitting enter on start it will start booting your Kali Linux so it will take some time because if you are opening it first time it will take it will going to take some time okay so as you can see that Kali Linux is booting now so here Kali Linux just hit enter and uh, it is booting now as you can see that and the logo of Linux is being glowing so after the completion of this glow your Kali Linux will be ready to use we will be seeing how to use Kali Linux and what are the basics Kali Linux command that we are going to use in this course or in the hacking journey so we are going to discuss all of these things later on in this course so as you can see that the booting process is going to be completed very soon so in case of Kali Linux 2020 version the username and the password will going to be root and also here root and hit enter so after hitting enter as you can see that now I am inside the Kali Linux okay so this is how you can install Kali Linux and you can use Kali Linux and the username will be root and the password will also be root okay so now this is the dashboard of the Kali Linux so we are going to see later what is Kali Linux and how we can work with Kali Linux so this video is basically for installing Kali Linux so now let's see in the next lecture how we can install another machine into our virtual box so thank you for watching this lecture so now it's time to see how to install metasploitable 2 machine inside the virtual box so what you need to do is you need to navigate to machine and when you click on this you will find new so when you click on new you will see this kind of window so this is asking for the name which you are going to name for uh, our metasploitable machine so i'm going to name it wall and type is linux and this is the place which is the machines folder 
and inside version what i'm going to choose it it is open to 64 and just click on next and after clicking on next it is asking for the ram how much ram you're gonna allot to this particular machine so i'm having 12 gb of ram so i'm going to allot it around 512 which is 512 mb of ram because it will be going to work very fine in this ram so just click on next and after clicking on next you will find this menu so you need to change to use an existing hard drive disk and just select the meta spatial machine folder where you have downloaded so what you need to do is you need to simply navigate to the folder where you have uh, downloaded your meta spatial machine so i'm going to navigate to that particular folder so that i can get inside it okay operating system and this is the folder where i have downloaded metasploit so when you click on this particular metasploit file and open it will just select the file and click on choose after choosing click on create so after creating as you can see that we have this particular file which is world so when you click on start it will start loading your meta spiritual machine so you have to wait till the completion of this you don't need to do anything you just sit back and just watch what is going in the screen now as you can see that whole process of installing is been done so this is asking for the username and the password so the username will be msf admin and the password will also seem msf admin and hit enter so after hitting enter as you can see that we are inside the meta split will to machine so what i'm going to do is i'm going to run one command which is if config which will tell us the ip address of this particular machine so after hitting enter as you can see that we have the it ip address which is at zero in the second line 10.0.2.15 so this is how we can install meta spiritual machine so this is uh, the machine where we are going to perform lots of attack so this is all for this lecture in the next lecture we are going to install owasp dwa thank you for watching this lecture hi guys we have successfully installed kali linux meta spiritual 2 machine now this time to install owasp dwa so for installing it you need to navigate to the folder where you have downloaded OWASP broken web application. So I have inside the folder, I'm inside the folder where I have downloaded it. So I'm going to just double click on the OWASP broken web app. So after double clicking, as you can see that we are going to inside VirtualBox. So we are inside VirtualBox. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to name it like OWASP BWA and after hitting enter on import you will see it will start importing the files so i'm going to just pause the video till the completion of this now file importing is being successful so next step that i'm going to do is i'm going to open it so when you click on this particular machine and click on start it will start booting when you open it first time it will going to take some time it depends upon how much RAM you have allotted to this particular machine. So as you can see that the booting process is being started and uh, just wait till the completion of all the process. Now installation process has been completed so it is asking for the login so the username will be root and the password will be owasp bwa and hit enter so as you can see that we are inside the owasp bwa vulnerable machine so as you can see that the ip address of this particular machine is if config hit enter so 
the IP address of this particular machine is 10.0.2.15. So this is the IP address of this particular machine. So we are going to see later how we can use all these IP addresses for our attacking. So this is all for this lecture. Thank you for watching this lecture. Hi guys, welcome to this module. In this module, we are going to learn about network penetration testing. So the network penetration testing is the first penetration testing that we are going to cover in this module. Most of the systems and computers are connected to the network. If a device is connected to the internet, that means the device is connected to the network because the internet is really a big network. Therefore, we need to know that how devices interact with each other in a network as well as how network works. So in network penetration testing, it is divided into three subsections. The first is pre-connection attack. In this section, we will learn about all the attacks that we can do before connecting to a network. Second, gaining attack. In this section, we will learn how to crack Wi-Fi keys and gain access to a Wi-Fi network whether they use WP, WPA, WPA2 network. Last but not the least, post connection attack. These attacks applies whenever you are able to connect to the network. In this section, we will learn the number of powerful attacks that allow you to intercept the connections and capture everything like the username, password, URL, chat messages. You can also modify the data as it has been sent in the air. These attacks can apply on both Wi-Fi or wide network. So this is the basic introduction of network penetration testing. In the next lecture, we are going to see some basics of networking. Thank you for watching this lecture. Hi everyone. In this lecture, we are going to see some basics of network. So what is a network? A network is a group of two or more devices that are connected to each other to share data or share the resources. A network can contain a number of different computer systems that is connected by a physical or a wireless connection via server or a router. This router has direct access to the internet. The device can only connect to the internet through the router or the access point. Now for example, suppose that the client or a device connected to a network through Wi-Fi or Ethernet. If the client opens a browser and types google.com, then your computer will send a request to the router for asking google.com. Then the router will go to the internet and request google.com that the router will receive google.com and forward that response to the computer. Now the client can see google.com on the browser as a result. In networking, devices on same network communicate with each other using packets. If you send a video, a login website, sending chat messages, sending emails, all the data is sent as a packet. In networking, devices ensure that these packets go in the right direction using the MAC address. Each packet has source MAC and a destination MAC and it flows from the source MAC address to the destination MAC address. So this is all about basics of networking that you will require throughout this course. So this is all for this lecture. Thank you. Hi everyone. Welcome to this new section. In this section, we are going to talk about what is wireless communication. So the term wireless can be constructed in many different ways depending on who you are speaking to. In general, this can encompass any transmission of data using a technology where the sender and the receiver of data are not connected by a physical medium. For an information technology concept, this will cover technologies such as microwave, cellular, mobile broadband, Bluetooth, LoRa, Zigbee and of course Wi-Fi. So this section will discuss about the basics of Wi-Fi communication and the protocol and the standard at the level of appropriate for security professional. Thankfully for us, we are able to benefit from lot of work done by an electrical engineer and a software engineer who have reduced the complexity of magically sending packets through the air at great speed down to something manageable. So let's start by discussing what is wireless LAN networking technology. So it is defined by the 
I triple E two eight hundred two dot one one working group. Wireless local area network, typically referred to as VLANs, a very popular technology that are used to create a network of client and device that do not require each host to be connected to the network via wired Ethernet connection. And the biggest advantage of VLANs are their ease of use, low cost of deployment, and dynamically operational model. So as mentioned that VLANs are easy to deploy and even homes user can buy an access point and start networking it with available mobile devices such as laptops, smartphones and tablets with little skill and in the short amount of time. It is typically just a matter of plugging in the access point and correctly configuring your mobile devices and the VLANs will be operational within a few minutes. And for VLANs in the corporate environment, many of the same principle applies through the complexity and the security consideration will typically increase linearly to the size of the deployment. Organizations typically have many access points and configuration to manage and it's common to see them deployed levering a controller model to ensure consistency. While this model varies from what you will typically see in the residential or SMB scenario underlying technology and weaknesses. To better understand the security risks associated with VLANs, we need to know how wireless stations and client communicate and the underlying technologies that enable the communication. So here are some VLAN component, which is radio and access point. So what is radio? So this is defined as the station in 802.11 standards and it will sometime be abbreviated as STA. It is the component that transmits the wireless signals access point. This provides connectivity with STAs, most likely laptops and other mobile devices. So the preceding components alone provide the hardware requirement to build VLAN. From a security perspective, wireless drivers and firmware on access point enables the hardware and operating system and an application stack will provide the management, user control, encryption and other functionality. As we look at the security consideration for each part of the stack that enables wireless connectivity, we have to ensure that all components are scrutinized. It is possible that vulnerability in some things as fundamental as device drivers may lead to the compromise of the AP or client. Additionally, firmware in an access point can potentially be infected with the malware, which can lead to the compromise of the client data connected to them. If you are a security professional taking this course to be better informed and better understand how to test and protect a wireless network you are responsible for, subsequent sections will provide you with uh, some guidance on known vulnerabilities, what to look out for, and operational best practices in addition to the demonstrated penetration testing practicals. So this is all for this lecture. In the next lecture, we are going to see what is wireless standards. Thank you for watching this lecture. Wireless standards. So the Wi-Fi Alliance is an organization that supports and certifies wireless technologies to ensure interoperability between vendors and it has been instrumental in bringing Wi-Fi to homes and businesses around the world. Early implementation of wireless technologies for network communication were hampered by interoperability issues and conflicting implementations because the IEEE did not have the testing equipment to ensure compliance with its standard. So this led to the creation of the Wireless Ethernet Compatibility Alliance, which is also called as WECA, who were promoting a new higher speed standard for wireless communication which ultimately become 802.11b. WECA was rebranded in 2002 as the Wi-Fi Alliance continues to validate and certify wireless technologies until this day in order to ensure interoperability and promote a standard industry. Today, wireless networking technologies used to implement VLANs are organized under the IEEE 108.11 specifications. They are an alphabet soap or protocol that defines the frequencies, transmission rate, bandwidth and modulation of the wireless communications. So as you can see that in this particular table, we are having these standards and protocols. So in this preceding table, 
DSSS indicates direct sequence spread spectrum and OFDM is orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. So these technologies refers to how the radio allocate the bandwidth to transmit the data over the air. Again, a big thank to wireless engineers for incorporating this complexity into a standard so that we don't necessarily need to know exactly how this works in order to send and receive packets wirelessly. So as we get into wireless capturing packet from the air, the concept of channel will come into play. So the term channel refers to a specific frequency within either the 2.4 GHz or 5 GHz frequency spectrum that the wireless radio on the access point and the client have either negotiated or being told to use for the communication of the data between them. So this similar to the channel on your TV set, think analog here, where the station transmits at the specific frequency and the television is configured to receive that specific frequency by tuning it to a specific channel. If both sides are configured to talk on the same channel, then the communication between two devices can proceed. So this is all about wireless standard. In the next lecture, we are going to see what is 2.4 GHz spectrum. Thank you for watching this lecture. Now the question is, what is the difference between 2.4 GHz and 5 GHz wireless frequencies? So the primary difference between the two frequencies are the range, coverage, bandwidth, speed that the band provides. The 2.4 GHz band provide coverage at a longer range but they transmit the data at slower speed. But in case of 5 GHz band provide less coverage but transmit data at very fast speed. So the range is lower in the 5 GHz band because higher frequencies cannot penetrate solid objects such as walls and floors. However, higher frequencies allows data to be transmitted faster than lower frequencies. So the 5 GHz band allows you to upload and download file faster. Your Wi-Fi connection on a particular frequency band can also be faster or slower because of interference from other devices. Many Wi-Fi enabled technologies and other household devices uses 2.4 GHz band, including microwave and garage door openers. When multiple devices attempt to use the same radio space, overcrowding occurs. So in case of 5 GHz band tends to have less overcrowding than 2.4 GHz band because fewer devices use it and because it has 23 channels for devices to use while the 2.4 GHz band has only 11 channels. So the number of channels that are available to depend on a regulatory domain. If you are experiencing a lot of interference from other devices, consider using 5 GHz band. So this is all about 2.4 GHz and 5 GHz. So before going further in this course, first we need to see what are the supported wireless modes. So in this course, we will discuss extensively make use of advanced features of wireless clients that are not supported on all adapters. So two of these features, monitor and master modes. These will help us capture the traffic and set up virtual access point respectively. And in the monitor mode, you are able to put your wireless adapter in the listening mode which is capable of capturing the wireless frames from the air while the master mode is essential for the setting up of an evil twin attack. These two modes are just some of the several supported modes in the various wireless adapter. So please make sure that which wireless adapter you are using should contain these two modes which is manage mode and the master mode. So now let's see how we can use all of these things, all of these networking knowledge by getting inside the network penetration testing. Hello guys. In this lecture, we are going to see how to configure your Wi-Fi adapter with the Kali Linux machine. So what you need to do is first you need to connect your Wi-Fi adapter with the laptop or the PC and then get into the virtual box. So inside virtual box, you will find Kali Linux and just click on Kali Linux and you will find settings. So when you click on settings, you will see this pop up window. So inside this pop up window, you will see this USB tab. So when you click on this USB tab, as you can see that I have connected with Atheros UB91C. So what you need to do is if you are doing it first time, so what it will show you, it will simply show you USB 2.0. So when you click on this particular thing, it will ask for the 
this particular symbol so when you click on add new usb filter so select your wi-fi adapter so i am currently using atheros ub91c so i will click on this and after clicking on this you will see this is done so when you click on ok so your wi-fi adapter is now configured with the wi-fi oh kali linux so what you going to do next is simply open your kali linux operating system and after opening kali linux operating system to make sure it is working or not get inside terminal window you will find this icon here and the next thing that you are going to do is simply type l susp and hit enter so what this command will do so this list the devices that are connected to the usb bus here you should be able to identify whether your wireless connector is seen by the operating system and if so include a short description of the device so this is how you can see your device is connected with it or not and the next command that i'm going to use is iw config so what this command will do so when you hit enter so this is used to set and view the parameters of the wireless interface seen by the operating system so here are, here you are able to bring the interface up and down so this is how we can see our wi-fi adapter is now connected with the kali linux or not so in the upcoming lecture we are going to see how we can use this wi-fi adapter for our network penetration testing thank you for watching this lecture welcome to the new section of this course in this section we will be covering the basics of kali linux we will see how kali linux looks when installed as a virtual machine and some of the basic elements of kali linux will be explained in detail furthermore into the upcoming videos we will be learn about the different commands that we can use in kali linux terminal once we have learned how to use kali linux commands we will be seeing how to update how to install how to uninstall things into the kali linux operating system so in the upcoming videos we are going to learn how to use kali linux in virtual box this is all for this lecture this is how our kali linux operating system looks like so these are the things that we can see in kali linux window okay so now let's start with this what is this this is a logo of kali linux so after clicking on this particular thing you can see here the status bar and these many things here so let's dive into it and let's see what it is so this is just like a search bar in windows if you want something and you don't know where it is you can type here just taking an example of burp suit i just want to search burp suit but i don't know the file location of burp suit to open so i just need to type here for that i need to type burp suit so this is completely like windows search bar okay so now let's see what it is so these all are the tools that are pre-installed in our kali linux operating system so you can make some your you can favorite your some tools that you frequently use so all the favorite tools will be here and recently used tools will be here and in the last uh, couple of days i'm using this multigo and social engineering that's why it is here in recently used and all the applications that are here so these many tools are here present in kali linux operating system and these are the categories which distinct use the tools according to their working so for that you just need to click on this just take an example of i just want to gather some information and i just need to use any particular tool for the uh, information gathering so i just need to click on this button which is information gathering and as you can see here these many tools are present here to gather information and as you can see here multigo in my recently use it is it was multigo okay so this is the categorized version of tools and this is for vulnerability analysis web application analysis database assessment password attack this is the most frequently used tools in password attack wireless attack and we are going to use some tools here like kismet and all air jack air crack ng these are the very important tools for the uh, wireless attack and this is reverse engineering exploitation tools sniffing and spoofing tools and these all tools are present according to their category so this is all about this particular logo 
so as you can see here this thing this is so this is just like a my document in our windows it will show you all kind of things that you want to visit this is just a place where you can find all the things here like windows templates public picture movies uh, music uh, downloads documents desktop and all and terminal so this is the terminal that will be that we will be using very frequently because terminal is just like a best friend for for the hacker because most of the work will be doing here we will be doing here okay and this is all and if you want to record your screen so you just need to click on this particular icon it will automatically record your screen as you can see a record a video or take a screenshot for your screen and now let's see the right hand corner of this window so this is showing us time and this is for the volume okay you can increase it you can decrease it, it depends upon you this is for the notification and this is showing the battery and this is for if you click on this particular it will just uh, lock your screen so for login you just need to once again type same things kali dot kali and here in this window you can see here log out restart shut down switch user hybrid sleep hibernate and suspend so this is all how our windows look like and if you want to change some settings you just need to click on this particular thing and here you can just click on settings so after clicking on settings you will find these many options okay so this is the setting menu of Kali Linux operating system so if you want anything here appearance display anything you can find here and uh, this is the trash trash is just like a recycle bin in our windows and this is home here you will find each and every document that is present in your operating system so this is like my computer okay this is home Kali Linux okay so this is all how Kali Linux looks like in the upcoming videos we will be seeing that how to use some commands in our terminal to make our work easier and this is all for this lecture in this video we are going to see the linux commands these are not the hacking commands they are not the penetration testing command they are just command used in linux that allows us to do different things on the operating system this overview of the of how the terminal works was just designed to get you more comfortable with the structures navigating the directories and so on so now let's take an overview of Kali Linux terminal. The terminal is a place where you can do anything you want on the operating system. Run any program by executing commands associated with the program we want. The Linux terminal is a very powerful tool. It basically allows us to do a lot more than the graphical interface. A lot of programs that we are going to use have graphical interface but the command line is much easier and quicker and also in many scenarios you will get a secure socket cell that is also called as SSH or command promote on a target computer and you will need to know the commands order to do what you wish on that particular computer or to just pen test its security learning how to deal with the command promote is very important and it is very easy because you just type some commands and the work is in front of you instant result we are going to use it a lot in the upcoming videos but for now we will be providing a very simple overview it is much easier than running through the graphical interface using it is very simple and very easy you literally type in the command and the result is displayed on the screen as test. So this is all for this lecture. In the upcoming videos, we are going to see some very important commands that we will be going to use very frequently in this course. In this lecture, we are going to see ls command. ls command is the first command in our list. ls command is just a command that we use even in, in our Windows operating system that was dir, D -I -R -D, that will show us how many directories in the present working directory okay so ls command is also called as list command so now i don't know where currently i am so i just want to see 
how many files how many directories are present there where i currently working on so let's type here ls and press enter so as you can see here desktop documents downloads music pictures public templates videos these are the folders are present here where currently i am working on so if you want to see where currently i am working on so you just need to type p wd and press enter so i am currently working on home kali linux this is also called as this uh, pwd command will tell you in which directory currently you are working on okay so now i am in home kali linux so i just want to see that how many things are inside this home kali linux working directory how many things are present here so let's type here ls and press enter so as you can see here desktop okay these many things so let's see graphically how it is accurate or not so as you can see here home kali linux so i'm just going to press home so in this home tab you can see here that desktop yes it is desktop documents download this is true information so this is how you we use terminal window it make our work very easy you just need to type some commands and you will be there you will see what particular things is working there and what you want to retrieve what you want to do you just need to click some uh, commands here so in this video we have learned about two commands the first one is ls and the second one is pwd so now let's repeat once again so now i want to see in which directory currently i am working on so i just want to type pwd for knowing the current working directly directory and press enter so currently i am working on home kali linux and i want to see how many folders are there in home kali linux so i just want to type ls and press enter so as you can see here these many folders are there and if i want to know more about these folders what i will do i will just type ls hyphen l and press enter so it will show us each and everything about these folders okay so this is how it works and this is how we use pwd uh, command and ls command so in the upcoming lecture we are going to see some more important commands the man command one of the most important commands which is going to become handy to you in the future is the man command and it stands for manual the man command can be used to query and get the manual of any other command so let's see how we can use man command so now let's see how man command works so for that you just need to know in which directory currently i am working on so for that we just need to click type pwd and press enter so currently i am working on home directory okay so now let's see how the man command works so for that type man and the command and press enter so this will show you show you the manual of this particular command okay so this is all about the manual of pwd command okay and so if you want to know what is the manual of any particular command you just need to type man and the command so this is how the manual of the pwd command looks like okay so now let's see what is the manual of ls command man ls and press enter so after plus pressing enter you can see here the manual of this command so this is how it works and uh, if you want to know more about so we have one more command in our list is that these all are the commands that we can use with ls to find more information about the list okay so so now let's see the other one so for clearing the screen we just need to type clear and press enter okay so in windows we use we use cls and in kali linux we use clear so the another command in our list is help command so for using help command you just need to type the command hyphen hyphen help and press enter so it will show each and everything about the command okay 
दीज आर द कमांड्स दैट वी कैन यूज विद द हेल्प एल एस कमांड सो दिस इज हाउ हेल्प कमांड वर्कस ओके नाउ लेट्स क्लियर दिस स्क्रीन एंड लेट्स सी हाउ इट वर्कस फॉर पी डब्ल्यू डी हेल्प एंड प्रेस एंटर सो दीज टू कमांड्स मैन एंड हेल्प विल बी वेरी हैंडी फॉर अस टू नो एनीथिंग अबाउट एनी पर्टिकुलर कमांड it's working how we can use that particular command very efficiently so we just need to use these particular commands okay so now this is all for this video in the upcoming lecture we are going to see some more commands about in we can use in kali linux thank you so now in this video we are going to see how to change the directory currently i am working on home directory now i just want to change home directory to desktop how i can change this directory using the terminal window so for that i'm going to use a command named as cd which is also called as uh, change directory command okay so cd command will change the directory where you want to change it okay now cd i just want to change directory to desktop so i will type desktop and forward slash and press enter so as you can see here the currently current working directory of mine is desktop so now let's see it is correct or not so currently i am on desktop okay so let's see how many things are there in desktop so there is nothing i don't have anything in the desktop okay so this is how we can use cd command so now if you want to get back into your the previous directory so for that you just need to type cd hyphen press enter so now as you can see here you are currently in home kali directory and this is how it works so for that you just i just want to see how many okay i just want to get to this directory which is called as downloads so copy selection and change cd and i will just paste and forward slash press enter so currently i am in downloads let's see folders inside download so i don't have anything inside download so it is showing me nothing so let's see is it true or not so yes i don't have anything that's why it is showing empty okay so this is how you can use cd to get into any directory you want so this is very important command this command will be very handy for you and this is all for this video in the upcoming videos we are going to learn how to use a command to make the folder without using the graphical user interface so now in this lesson we are going to see how to create folders using the terminal window so this video will going to be very interesting for us because this video will teach us that how to create any particular uh, folder without using the graphical user interface and if we talk about graphical user interface you can create using this this okay so now using terminal how we can create a document so for that we just need to see where i am i am in home kali so i'm going to change it desktop and press enter okay so uh, currently i am in desktop so let's listed nothing is in desktop so i am going to make a folder so for creating the folder kali linux have a command named as mkdir which is mkdir which is also called as make directory okay so mkdir so i just want to make the folder in this area okay so which is in desktop so desktop mkdir this is command for creating the folder and i'm going to name my folder as hello and press enter so as you can see here this folder is here the folder is ready to use okay so now i just want to make one more folder inside it so how i can make that kind of folder so for that i just need to type this whole thing and forward slash and the folder name and the folder name will be like name and press enter so we created hello and now inside hello we created a folder called as name 
so now let's see is it there or not so firstly we are going to see using graphical user interface name okay so now i just want to make one more folder inside name so i am going to make it 2020 and press enter so is it or not so let's see here yes the folder is ready to use so now i just want to i just want to see using using this uh, terminal window how it looks like so for that i just want to make ls so currently i am hello and currently i am desktop so i'm going to change my directory to hello okay hello is here so for that i just need to type hello for slash so currently i am hello let's ls list and this folder is inside hello okay so now i'm going to change directory to name okay so for that name for slash press enter so currently i am name let's see which folder is inside name and it is 2020 so let's change this to 2020 okay cd 2020 forward slash enter so currently i am in 2020 let's ls it nothing is inside 2020 that's why it is showing nothing to us okay so this is how we can use this command so so now let's get back to the desktop okay so now currently i am in okay so this is how you can use these all commands to create the directory and uh, this is all you can create directory using folder using the terminal window this is very easy process you just need to type some commands and the folder will be ready to use so this is all for this lecture and in the upcoming sections we are going to learn how to start your penetration journey how to hack networks, how to hack website, how we can perform all kinds of attack using this Kalinux operating system. Okay, so this is all for this lecture and uh, thank you for watching this video and see you have a good day. So guys, in this lecture, we are going to talk about what is cyber attacks. So cyber attacks is an exploitation of computer system and networks. It uses malicious code to alter computer code, logic or data and led to cyber crimes such as information and identity theft. We are living in a digital era. Nowadays, most of the people use computer and internet. Due to the dependency on digital things, the illegal computer activity is growing and changing like any time of crime. So cyber attacks can be classified into two categories. So the first that we have here is web-based attacks and the next one is system-based attacks. So in the next lecture, we are going to talk about what is web-based attacks. So now guys, we are inside web-based attacks. So these are the attacks which occurs on a website or web application. So some of the important web-based attacks as you can see here. So now let's talk about injection attack. So it is the attack in which some data will be injected into a web application to manipulate the application and fetch the required information. And the example that we have here is SQL injection, code injection, log injection, XML injection, etc. And then we are having DNS spoofing. DNS spoofing is a type of computer security hacking whereby a data is introduced into a DNS resolver's cache causing the name server to return an incorrect IP address and diverting traffic to the attacker's computer or any other computer. So the DNS spoofing attack can go on for a long period of time without being detected and can cause serious security issue. Then we are having session hijacking. So what is session hijacking? It is security attack on a user session over a protected network. A web application creates cookies to store the data or state or a session, user session. By storing the cookie, an attacker can have access to all the user's data. Now, pissing. Pissing is a type of attack which attempts to steal sensitive information like user login credentials or credit card numbers. It occurs when an attacker is misgardening as a trustworthy entity in electronic communication. Then we are having brute force. So what is brute force? It is a type of attack which uses a trial and error method. 
This attack generates a large number of guesses and validates them to obtain actual data like user password and personal identification number. This attack may be used by criminals to crack encrypted data or by security and analysis to test an organization's network security. Then we are having DOS denial of service. In this attack, which means to make a server or a network resources unavailable to the user, it compromises or it complaces this is by flooding the target with the traffic or sending it information that triggers a crash. It uses the single system and single internet connection to attack a server. It can be classified into following types like volume based attacks. So what is volume based attacks? It goal, its goal is to saturate the bandwidth of the attacked site and is measured in bit per second. And that uh, if we talk about protocol attack, it consumes actual server resources and is measured in a packet. And last but not the least, we are having application layer attack. So its goal is to crash the web server and is measured in request per second. Okay. So the next that we have here is dictionary attack. So what is dictionary attack? So this type of attack is stored the list of a commonly used passwords and validated them to get original password. Okay, so the next that we have here is URL interpretation. It is a type of attack where we can change the certain part of a URL and one can make a web server to deliver web pages for which he see not authorized to browser. And then we are having file inclusion attack. So what is file inclusion attack? It is a type of attack that allows an attacker to access unauthorized or essential files which is available on a web server or to execute malicious files on a web server by making use of including functionality. Last but not the least, we are having here man in the middle attack. Okay. So what is man in the middle attack? It is a type of attack that allows an attacker to intercept the connection between the client and server and acts as a bridge between them. Due to this, an attacker will be able to read and insert and modify the data in the intercepted connection. So this is all about web-based attacks. I hope you guys understand it. And in the next lecture, we are going to see what is system-based attacks, which is very important to understand. So thank you for watching this lecture. Hello, welcome to this new lecture. In this lecture, we are going to see what is system-based attacks. So these are the attacks which are intended to compromise a computer or a computer network. Some of the important system-based attacks, as you can see here, virus, worm, trojan horse, backdoors, and bots. So the first one in our list is virus. So virus, what is virus? It is a type of malicious software program that is spread throughout the computer files without the knowledge of a user. It is a self-replicating malicious computer program that replicates by inserting copies of itself into other computer programs when executed. It can also execute instructions that cause harm to the system. The next one that we have here is WOM. So it is a type of malware whose primary function is to replicate itself to spread to uninfected computers. It works same as the computer virus WOM often originate from the email attachments that appears to be from trusted senders. And then we are having Trojan horse. It is a malicious program that occurs unexpected changes to computer setting and unusual activity, even when the computer should be idle. Now it is misleads the user of its true intent. It appears to be a normal computer application, but when opened or executed, some malicious code will run in the background. Then we are having backdoors. So what is backdoors? It is a method that bypasses the normal authentication process. A developer may create a backdoor so that an application or operating system can be accessed through troubleshooting or other purposes. The next we have here is bot. So what is bot? A bot, short form of robot. It is an automated process that interacts with other computer network or networking services some bots programs run automatically while other or others only executed commands when they have received specific input. Some example of bots programs are the crawlers, chat bot rooms and malicious bots. So these all are the system based attacks.
So this is all for this lecture. Hi guys, pre-connection attack. Pre-connection attack is the first part of the network penetration testing. And to perform this attack, we will look at the fundamentals like how to show all the network around us, how to find the details of all the connected devices to a particular network. Once we know about the network and connected devices to it, we can disconnect any device without knowing the password of that particular device. So here we have some following basic steps that we will follow or that we will be going through to perform pre-connection attack. So the first one is wireless interface in monitor mode. In this step, we will change the mode of the wireless device as monitor mode. The next is about arrow dump ng. In this step, we will use arrow dump ng to list all the network around us and display useful information about them. The next one is run arrow ng. In this step, we will see all the devices that are connected to a particular network and collect more information about it. Last but not the least, deauthentication or deauthenticate the wireless client. In this step, we will discuss or we will disconnect any device which is shown in the previous step using the AirPlay ng. So this is the basic overview of this particular section. Hello everyone, in this lecture we are going to see how to connect with your wireless interface. So what you need to do here is first of all you need to check you have connected with it or not. So for that you need to go to VirtualBox. So and inside VirtualBox as you can see that we are having here. So just uh, click on Kali Linux and click on setting. So after navigating to setting you can find that we are having here serial ports or we can say USB. So when you click on USB, you can see that now I am connected with Ethero's UB91C. So just so this is my USB interface. So if you are not connected with it, so what you need to do here is you need to just click on add new. So when you click on add new, you will select your uh, Wi-Fi adapter and after selecting it, just click on OK. So you will be automatically connected with it. OK. So the next thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to simply get back to my Kali Linux machine. So here what I'm going to do, I'm going to first of all see that currently I'm in which mode. So there is necessary you should have monitor mode enabled Wi-Fi adapter or interface. OK. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to simply type IW config and hit enter. So this will show us our wireless interface which is VLAN and as you can see mode manage. So currently we are in manage mode. So the next thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to simply disable my Wi-Fi adapter okay, or Wi-Fi interface. So I will be typing if config VLAN 0. So this is the name of my interface and down. So after just uh, after hitting enter, as you can see that the light blinking on your interface will be stopped. Now the next thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to give the command airmon. Okay, airmon ng check kill. So what it will do, it will just simply use to kill any process that could interfere with using my interface in monitor mode. After this command, your internet connection will be lost. So hit enter. Okay, it is checking and uh, everything is correct. Check kill. Yes, everything is correct. So as you can see that the process has been completed. So the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to use command IW config VLAN 0. This is the name of my interface. And the next is mode monitor. So this is the command to convert your Wi-Fi interface from manage mode to monitor mode. And now hit enter. So now you are currently in monitor mode. So the thing we need to do is we need to type it config VLAN 0 up. And this will just up my interface and hit enter. So after hitting enter as you can see that the blinking light will be start. Now IW config VLAN 0. So when you click on enter button, you will see that this is the name of your interface and the currently working mode is monitor. So this is how you can change your mode 
of your interface so this is not very complex process this is very easy process what you need to do is you need to simply just uh, okay let me start from the starting you need to just see in which mode you you are currently working on and then you need to just down your wi-fi interface and then just kill all the processes after that just change your mode to the monitor and then enable it and then see in which mode you are currently working on so this is how you can just change your uh, Wi-Fi adapter mode. So thank you for watching this lecture. Welcome everyone. In this lecture, we are going to see what is AeroDump NG. So AeroDump NG is used to list all the network around us and display useful information about them. It is a packet sniffer, so it is basically designed to capture all the packets around us. While we are in monitor mode, we can run it against all the networks around us and collect useful information like MAC address, channel name, encryption type, number of clients connected to the network and then start targeting to the network. We can also run it against certain AP so that we can only capture packets from the certain Wi-Fi network. So now let's see how we can use this particular tool which is Aerodome. So what you need to do here is first of all let's check your wireless adapter is in monitor mode or not. So as you can see that it is in monitor mode. Okay so now let's clear the screen first. So after clearing the screen type arrow dump ng and the name of your interface and now hit enter here. So after hitting enter as you can see that it is started sniffing so here we are having two Wi-Fi routers which is this one and this one okay so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to tell you what is the meaning of each and every terms okay so now let's start with BSSID so BSSID shows the MAC address of the target network the next one is PWR which is also called as power so power shows the signal strength of the network. Higher the number has better signal. The next is beacons. Beacons are the frames sent by the network in order to broadcast its existence. The next one is data. What is data? Data shows the number of data packets or the number of data frames. The next is S. So this shows the number of data packets that we collected in the past 10 seconds. Okay, now the next one is CH, which is also called as channel. So, CH shows the channel on which the network works on. And then we are having MB, so this is for MB. And next one is encryption, E and C. Encryption shows the encryption used by the network, the type of encryption used by the network actually. So, it can be WEP, OPN, WPA, WPA2. The next one is Cypher. Cypher shows the cipher used in the network, which kind of cipher is using by the network. The next one is auth. Auth shows the authentication used on the network. Last but not the least, ESSID shows the name of the network. So this is how you can recognize all these terms. So this is all for this lecture. Thank you for watching this lecture. Now okay. In this step, we will run Aerodom NG to see all the devices that are connected to a particular network and collect more information about it. Once we have a network to the target, it is useful to run Aerodom on that network only instead of running it on all the networks around us. So currently we are running Aerodom NG on all the network around us. So now we are going to target this one which is Freak Among the Wallet. Now, we are going to target this particular Wi-Fi network. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to simply open a new window and now let's zoom it. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give command here which is arrow dump ng bssid and I'm going to enter the BSS ID of this particular Wi-Fi network 18 4A 
be careful while writing this particular id and uh, to e dc b0 okay so this is the basis id so the next thing that i'm going to do here is i'm going to specify the channel okay so the channel that this wi-fi is using is wi-fi router is using is three okay so i'm going to give here three okay so the next thing that i'm going to give here is the name which is uh LAN zero so this is the name of interface now hit enter so now as you can see that after hitting enter we are having all these networks that are connected with this particular wi-fi network so before going inside this let's first decode what each and every command means here okay so bssid so this is the access point mac address it is used to eliminate extraneous traffic and the next one is b channel okay so the next one is channel so channel is nothing but uh, it is for the aerodom ng to sniff on on which channel aerodom ng is going to sniff so that's why we need to specify here and then we are having the name of our interface okay so this thing is clear so the next thing as you can see here is we are having these many networks which are connected with this particular wi-fi so what we can do here is we are not going to do anything in this particular lecture we are going to learn what each and every command means here okay now we are we are, we are having bssid so bssid means here is bss id of all the devices is same because devices are connected to the same network the next one is station a station a station shows the number of devices that are connected to this network pwr which is also called as power so this shows the power strength of each of the device then we are having rate rate shows the speed we are having lost lost shows the amount of data loss and then we are having frames so frame is nothing but this shows the number of frames that we have captured so this is how you can get inside any particular network okay guys in this lecture we are going to see what is the authentication attack okay so these attacks are very useful these attacks allows us to disconnect any device from any network that is within our range even if the network has encryption or uses a key in the authentication attack we are going to pretend to be client and send a deauthentication packet to the router by changing our mac address to the mac address of the client and tell the router that we want to disconnect from you at the same time we are going to pretend to be router by changing our mac address to the router's mac address until the client that we are requesting to be disconnected after this the connection will be lost through this process we can disconnect or deauthenticate any client from any network so to do this we will use a tool called airplay ng so first of all we will run aerodom ng on the network so as you can see that we have already here aerodom ng because we want to see which client to device are connected to it so to run this particular tool what we need to do here is open the window make it zoom and type air play ng okay ng now hyphen hyphen d auth these are the packets that we will be sending to our target hyphen a hyphen a is nothing but the bss id of the wi-fi okay now let's see 18 4a 2e dc and p0 now let's check it again 1c 18 4a 2e dc and b okay everything is correct and then we are going to give the station of the device that we want to disconnect okay hyphen c now station that i'm going to choose is um, this station which is 16 8 okay 
so station that I'm going to choose is 16 8a and 58 b5 b5 e7 and then 9f okay and then specify the LAN 0 which is the name of our interface okay now let's try to run this command so as you can see that the thing is being started so after executing this command the device whose station is this lost the internet connection we can only connect to the device again when we quit this particular executing command like control C okay so the process has been done now let's understand what each and every command means here so first we are having D auth so D auth is used to tell airplay ng that we want to run a deauthentication attack and assign this much of packets the next one is hyphen a hyphen a is used to specify the mac address of the router and hyphen c hyphen c specify the mac address of the client and lan 0 as you all know that is the name of our interface so this is all for this lecture this is how you can disconnect any device from any network so thank you for watching this lecture now guys welcome to the new section of this course in this section we are going to learn what is gaining access gaining access attack is the second part of this network penetration testing in this section we will connect to the network and this will allow us to launch our powerful attacks and get more accurate information if a target doesn't use encryption we can just connect to it and sniff out unencrypted data if a network or the target is wired so we can use a cable and connect to it perhaps through changing our mac address and the only problem here is when the target uses encryption like WPE, WPA, WPA2, if we do encounter encrypted data, we need to know the key to decrypt it. That is the main purpose of this section. If the network uses encryption, we can't get anywhere unless we decrypt it. In this section, we will discuss that how to break that encryption and how to gain access to the network whether they use WPE, WPA, WPA2. So in this section we are going to cover WPA introduction, basic WPA cracking, fake authentication, ARP request replay, WPA theory, handshake theory, capturing handshakes, creating wordlets, wordless cracking and securing network from attacks. So this is all for this lecture. So now let's start with the section. Now let's learn what is WPE which is Wireless Equivalent Privacy. It is the oldest one and it can be easily broken. WPE uses the algorithm called RC4 encryption. In this algorithm each packet is encrypted at the router or access point and then sent out into the air. Once the client receives the packet, the client will be able to transform it back to its original form because it has the key. In other words, we can say that the router encrypts the packet and send it and the client receives and decrypts it. And the same happens if the client sends something to the router. It will first encrypt the packet using a key and send it to the router and the router will be able to decrypt it because it has the key. In this process, if a hacker captures the packet in the middle, then they will get the packet and but they won't be able to see the content of the packet because they don't have the key. So each packet that is sent into air has a unique key stream. So the unique key stream is generated using a 24-bit initialization vector. An initialization vector is a random number that is sent into each packet in plain text form, which is not encrypted. If someone captures the packet, they will not be able to read the packet content because it is encrypted, but they can easily read the IV or initialization vector in plain text form. 
so the weakness with the iv is that it is send in the plain text and it is very short only 24 bit so in a busy network there will be a large number of packets sent in the air at the at that time 24 bit number is not big enough and iv and the iv will start repeating on a busy network so the repeated ivs can be used to determine the key stream so this makes wpa who are unable to statistical attack so to determine the key stream we can use a tool called aircrack ng so this tool is used to determine the key stream once we have enough repeated iv then it will also be able to crack wep and give us the key to the network so this is all about WEP. Thank you. Now it's time to see what is web cracking. In order to crack web, which is also called as WEP, we need to first capture the large number of packets. That means we can capture a large number of IVs. Once we have done that, we will use a tool called Aircrack NG. This tool will be able to use a statistical attack to determine the key stream and the web key for the target network. So this method is going to be better when we have more than two packets and our chances of breaking the key will be higher. So now let's look at the most basic case of cracking web key. So to do this, we will set Wi-Fi card in monitor mode. So first check it. Okay, so we are having VLAN 0 okay so this is in monitor mode clear this okay so we have complete this step so the next step is we are going to launch aerodum so how we can launch aerodum aero dump ng interface name hit enter so as you can see that we are having these many networks around us Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to see for this network, which is web. Okay, so I'm going to open a new screen again or new window. Here, I'm going to give command like. Okay, I'm going to give command here. Arrow dump. NG. Hyphen hyphen BSS ID. And the name of bss id of the bss id of the wi-fi router so hyphen uh, sorry 1c 18 4a 2e dc b0 so this is the bss id of the wi-fi and then we are going to give channel which is here is three okay so the next thing we are going to write here is hyphen hyphen right so what this will do so this will simply store all the packets that we capture into a file which is web okay now the name of the file will be like web mm, okay web 98 v land zero and hit enter so after hitting enter it it will be start storing all the data packets into that file so it will take around one to uh, two hours depending upon depending upon your data uh, your traffic okay so i have already stored all the packets in one file so i'm going to show you how you can crack it okay now let's open one window again it is looking like very messy don't worry ls so i am having this file here web hyphen zero one cap okay copy clear the screen and now i'm going to run air crack this is the tool okay now the file i'm going to paste here okay and i think everything is correct now hit enter so as you can see that 
after analyzing all the stored data packet now it is having our key which is the password of wi-fi so the password here is one two three four five so when you enter this password to the particular wi-fi key field so it will you will automatically get inside that particular network so this is how you can crack wep network using this method so this is all for this lecture hi guys in this lecture, we are going to see what is fake authentication attack. In the previous lecture, we saw how easy it is to crack a web key on a busy network. In a busy network, the number of data increases very fast. One problem that we could face is if the network is not busy. If the network is not busy, the number of data will be increased very, very slowly. At that time, we are going to fake as an access point that doesn't have any client connected to it or an access point that has a client connected to it but the client is not using the network as heavily as the client in the previous lecture so now let's look at an example now we will run arrow dump so as you can see that i'm going to terminate this process i'm going to run arrow dump and hit enter so as you can see that we are having this particular AP. Okay, so the same AP that we have used before, but the difference is that we have disconnected the clients that were connected to this attack. As we can see here that in the client area, there is no client connected and the data is about to zero and it didn't even go to one. So the next thing that I'm going to do is to solve this problem. What we can do is inject packet into the traffic. When we do this, we can force the access point to create a new packet with the new IV, which is in them and then capture these IVs. But we have to authenticate our device with the target AP before we can inject packets. Access points have list of all the devices that are connected to them and they can ignore any packet that come from a device that is not connected. If a device that doesn't have any key tries to send a packet to the router, the router will just ignore all the packets and it won't even try to see what is inside it. Before we can inject packets into a router, we have to authenticate ourselves with the router. So to do this, we are going to use fake authentication method. So in the previous lecture, we already executed arrow dump. So now let's see how we can use fake authentication. Now we can see that auth has no value here. Okay. It is having no value here. Once we have done fake authentication, we will see an OPN, which is also called as open, shows up there, which will mean that we have successfully falsely authenticated our device with the target AP. Now we are going to use the command for doing all this step or all this process is airplay ng hyphen hyphen fake auth zero a and the BSS ID of the Wi-Fi router, which is this. Okay. Now two E D C B zero. So this is the BSS ID of the Wi-Fi router. So the next thing is hyphen H and here we need to write our interface mac address so how you can write it you can simply type if config line zero and hit enter okay if config line zero router okay so something is okay iw config first yes my mode is connected now let's try to to if config land zero everything is correct hmm flag land zero is this and uh, 
दिस इज करेक्ट वन टू थ्री फोर फाइव सिक्स ओके एंड इन केस हेयर वन टू थ्री फोर फाइव सिक्स ओके सो दिस इज अवर दिस इज अवर मैक एड्रेस ओके सो नाओ लेट्स कॉपी ओके एंड गेट बैक टू अवर कमांड लाइन नाओ लेट्स पेस्ट इट हेयर and the thing that you need to fix here is just change hyphen with the this particular symbol okay so now everything is clear the next thing land zero okay and hit enter so as you can see that in the case of here auth is open so before doing this i need i want to first show you or tell you that what each command means here because it is very important to understand what you are doing and why you are doing so with airplay we are going to use fake attack is this clear yes this is clear now here what i'm going to do here is uh, in this attack we include the type of attack and the uh, number of packets that we want to send which is hyphen hyphen fake auth so we are going to use hyphen a here okay hyphen a to include the target network which is this okay sorry which is this okay now after this we are going to add hyphen h to include the mac address of our interface and then this is the name of interface so now as you can see that auth is open so this is our target that we want to achieve so this is how you can do this okay now from the next lecture onwards we are going to see and we are going to see what is arp request replay attack so i think you all guys are enjoying all these things so don't forget to read this course thank you for watching this lecture now in this lecture we are going to see what is arp request replay attack so ap now accept packets that we send to it because we have successfully associated ourselves with it by using fake authentication attack we are now ready to inject packet into the ap and uh, make the data increase very quickly in order to decrypt the web key ARP request replace in the first method of packet injection in this method we are going to wait for the ap packet and capture the packet and inject into the traffic once we do this the ap will be forced to create a new packet with a new ivs we will capture the new packet inject it back into the traffic again and force the ap to create an other packet with another iv we will be repeating this process until the amount of data is high enough to crack the wap key so now what we are going to do here is we are going to open a new window first okay so we are going to write the command here arrow dump arrow dump ng okay arrow dump ng bssid and uh, okay arrow dump ng hmm arrow dump ng bssid is this i don't want to write it again and again so that's why i use this method and the uh, channel is i think 3 yes it is 3 channel name is 3 and hyphen hyphen write okay so arp request test vlan 0 now so we are going to add hyphen hyphen write command to store all the packets that we capture into a file which is arp request reply test so when it run we will see that the target network has zero data it has no client associated with it and there is no traffic going through which means it is not useful we can't crack it for key okay so to solve this problem we are going to perform a fake authentication 
attack as shown in the section so that we can start injecting packets into the network so it will accept them so that led us to our next step which is arp request reply step and in this step we will inject packet into the target network forcing it to create new packet with new ivs so what i'm going to do here is i'm going to simply okay one more time i'm going to open one more window okay so the command that i'm going to use here is the command will be same but the different here is simply arp replay okay arp replay and in k in place of a i'm going to use b and rest of the thing will be yes okay rest of the thing will be same so this command is very similar to the previous command that we have used in our last lecture but we are going to use arp reply instead of fake auth we will also include hyphen b for bss id and with the command we are going to wait for an arp packet capture it and then reinject into uh, into out the air and we can then see that we can we have captured an arp packet and inject it capture another inject into the traffic and so on so the ap that create new packet with new ivs we receive them we inject them again and this happen over and over again after executing this command as you can see that this will be the result so at this time the wireless adapter lan0 is waiting for arp request or arp packet actually once there is an arp packet transmitted in the network it is going to capture the packet and then trans retransmit it and once it has done the access point will be forced to generate a new packet with a new iv and we will capture and we will keep doing this since the access point will continuously generate the new packets with new ivs so the amount of data reaches around uh, okay 9000 or ever we can launch the air crack ng to crack it so we have to wait till the completion to around 10000 okay so what i am going to do here is i am going to pause this video here and then we will see how to see uh, after completion of all the packets then we will see how to use air crack ng okay now the process has done so what i am going to do is i am going to open the terminal window again and i am going to run the command for uh, getting the key so before going to use that particular command what i am going to show you here is i am going to show you the file where all the packet detail is okay now inside the root we are having this particular arp request test 0 so this is the file where all the related information about ta uh, about packets is there okay so now let's try to run that particular command which is air crack ng and the file name so file name you can copy from here okay and copy from here paste clipboard so this is the file so now let's try to run this and see it will gonna help us or not so now it has started working and as you can see that we have successfully having the key encryption key we have successfully break the encryption key so this is the key that we want to get inside the network to use that particular network so 1 2 3 4 5 this is the version and this is the version of sky so this is how you can use this air crack and this is how you can do all these steps and follow all this step one by one to crack any web network or any web uh, wifi password or encryption key using this method even you are not having the large number of traffic okay so i have shown you that we are having two method to break into web the first method is for heavy traffic and the second method is for no traffic at all okay so these two method will be very helpful so from the next lecture onwards we are going to start with wpa so thank you for watching this lecture in this lecture we are going to discuss about what is wpa or wifi protected access encryption
After WEP, this encryption has designed to address all of the issues that made WP very easy to crack. In WEP, the main issue is sort IV, which is sent as a plain text in each packet. The sort IV means that possibility of having unique IV is in each packet can be exhausted in active network so that when we are injecting packets, we will end up with more than one packet that has the same IV. At the same time, Aircrack NG can use a statistical attack to determine the key stream and WEP key for the network. In WPA, each packet is encrypted using a temporary key or a unique key. It means that the number of data packets that we collect is irrelevant. If we collect 1 million packets, these packets are also not useful because they don't contain any information that we can use to crack the WPA key. WPA2 is the same as WPA. It works with the same method and using the same method, it can be cracked. The only difference between WPA and WPA2 is that WPA2 uses an algorithm called counter mode cipher block changing message authentication code protocol which is also called as CCMP for encryption. Now, handshake. In WPA, each packet is encrypted using a unique temporary key. It is not like WEP, where IVs are repeated and we collect a large number of data packets with the same IVs. In each WPA packet, there is a unique temporary IV. Even if we collect 1 million packets, these packets will not be useful for us. These packets don't contain any information that can help us to determine the actual WPA key. The only packet that contain useful information and help us to determine the key are the handset packet. These are the four packets and these packets will be sent when a new device connect to the target network. For example, suppose we are at home. Our device connect to the network using the password and a process called four-way handshake happens between the AP and the device. In this process, four packets called the handshake packet get transfers between the two devices to authenticate the device connection. We can use a word list using the air crack and test each password in the word list by using the handshake. To crack WP encrypted network, we need two things. We need to capture the handshake and we need a word list that contain passwords. Hi everyone, welcome to the capturing handshake. So to crack WPA key, firstly we will capture the handshake using the arrow dump ng. We will capture the handshake in the same way that we used in web encryption network. So what we are going to do here is first of all we are going to check that we are connected with our interface or not. So what I am going to type if config and hit enter so as you can see that i am successfully connected with my wi-fi okay so now let's check i'm in monitor mode or in manage mode so for that i need to use if config vlan 0 now as you can see that i am in monitor mode okay so the next thing that i'm going to do here i'm going to use arrow dump arrow dump ng vlan interface name and hit enter so now we will as you can see that here we are having this network okay so which is wpa so now we will run arrow dump ng against this particular network okay so the bss id for this is this okay and we are going to attack this one okay we are going to attack this one because the power of this particular network is high okay okay this one this power is very high and as compared to others okay so what we are going to do here is we are going to open one more window let's zoom it now okay after adjusting what the command that i'm going to give here arrow dump ng okay now bssid and the BSS ID of this particular network okay so BS, what is the BSS ID for this BSS ID for this particular is 18 
फोर ए टू ई डी सी बी जीरो सो दिस इज द बी एस एस आई डी सुना लेट मी चेक इट अगेन सी एटीन फोर ए डी सी ओके सो द आई डी इज करेक्ट नाउ लेट स्पेसिफाई द चैनल नेम सो द चैनल इज चैनल वन ओके चैनल वन and then what we are going to do here is we are going to simply write fab handshake handshake vlan so what is this so we add hyphen hyphen right here to store all the packets that we will capture in a file called fab handshake and then we will include our wireless interface so now launch this attack so once we launch this command we will have our wpa encrypted network so now we will have the client connected to it as you can see that we are having two clients that are connected with this particular network okay this one and this one okay now we can capture the handshake in two ways first we can just sit down and wait for the device to connect to a network once a device is connected then we can capture the handshake second is we can use the authentication attack which we learned in the previous section in pre connection attack section in the authentication attack we can disconnect any device from a network that is within our wifi range if we apply this attack for a very short period of time we can disconnect a device from a network for a second and uh, the device will try to disconnect to a network automatically and even the person using the device will not notice that the device is disconnected or redisconnected reconnected okay so then we will be able to capture the handshake packet so the handshake gets sent every time a device connect to a network so now what we are going to do here is we are going to use new window here okay we are going to use new window here so here we are going to use airplay d auth packets that we are going to send is for hyphen a and the bss id of the network that is 1 c 18 4 a 2 e d c B zero. Okay, so this is the BSS ID for the network hyphen C and BSS ID for the client. Okay, so which client is near to me? I am going to use for uh, one A. Okay. Now one A one A two two C one and zero two. E three zero four okay, and let's specify the name of our interface VLAN zero okay. So everything is clear now. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to launch the attack. So as you can see that AirPlay okay AirPlay NG. I forgot to add NG here. NG okay now hit enter so as you can see that the attack is being done <laughs> okay so the attack is being done so we were disconnected for a very short period of time so that's why we didn't get any message about being disconnected that's why even the person using the device didn't notice and uh, we were able to capture the handshake so to determine the WPA key. we can use a word list and run it against the handshake hi everyone as we all know that we have captured the handshake now all we need to do is create a word list to crack the wpa key a word list is just a list of words that air crack ng is going to go through and try each one against the handshake until it successfully determines the wpa key If the word list is better, the chances of cracking WPA key will be higher. If the password is not in our word list file, 
we will not be able to determine the WPA key. So now let's see what is the syntax of creating the word list. So in this case, we are going to use the tool which is called crunch. So that will help us to create the word list. Okay. So syntax will be like crunch. You will write, you will write it like this minimum character, maximum character. Okay. And uh, this is for the character. Okay. And you can also use hyphen T pattern for the pattern. Okay. And hyphen O for the file. Okay. For the file name. Now, so now let's decode each and one, each and every one. Okay. So we are having here crunch. So crunch is the name of the tool and min is specify the minimum number of characters for the password to be generated max max specify the maximum number of characters for the password and then we are having characters so characters specify the characters that we want to use in the password for example you can put all the lowercase character or uppercase characters numbers and symbols okay now hyphen t hyphen t what is hyphen t hyphen t is uh, optional it is specified the pattern and hyphen o hyphen o specify the file name where the password are going to be stored okay so if you know the part of password hyphen t option will be very useful for example if we if we are trying to guess the password of someone and we have seen him typing the password and we know that the password start with a and ends with b now we can use the pattern option and tell crunch to create the password that always start with a and end with b and put all the possible combinations of the characters that we put in the command okay so we are going to use crunch and uh, then we are going to make a minimum 8 to uh, 6 to 8 uh, characters of password and we are going to put uh, like okay so now let's try to write and create the word list so you will you will write like this and minimum 6 maximum eight characters and I will give like this is the my sample one okay so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to store it on test okay dot txt okay is this clear okay so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just hit enter so after hitting enter as you can see that crunch will now generate the following number of lines okay now crunch 100% completed generating output. So what the next thing that I'm going to do here, I'm going to see what crunch has done for us. Test.txt. Okay. Now hit enter. So as you can see that these many possible combinations of password crunch prepared for us. Okay. Now so this is how you can create the password and uh, use that word list inside the inside the uh, aircrack ng so this is all for this lecture thank you now guys in the last video we have captured all the handshakes so in this lecture i'm going to show you that how to just uh, crack the password of wpa and wpa2 so for that you need to open your terminal window and let's zoom it first okay okay after zooming it what you need to do here is you need to open the folder and inside folder you can see that this is the handshake file and this is the uh, word list so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to simply type air crack ng okay aircrack ng and uh, the file name vap okay aircrack ng and the file name vap handshake 01 handshake 01 dot cap okay and hyphen w and the name of our word list which is test dot txt and this is the command that you, you are going to use when you are performing all these kinds of uh, attacks so when you click on this it will give you the password so it will take some time so what i'm going to do here is i'm going to simply uh, pause the video and uh, after the completion of all this process so i will just uh, 
the pause the video okay hi guys welcome to the new section in this section we are going to learn what is post connection attacks all the attacks that we perform in a peak connection and gaining access section we won't connect it to a network in this section we are going to be taking post connection attack that means the attack that we are can do after connecting to the network now it doesn't matter that the network is wireless or a wired network it does matter that a target was using web or wpa we can launch all the attacks that we going to talk about in this section in all the previous attacks we kept our wireless card in monitor mode so that we could capture any packet that goes in the ear now in this section we are going to use our wireless card as manage mode because we access to the network so we really don't need to capture everything we only want to capture packets that are directed to us in this section we are going to look at the attack that can perform when we break through the network firstly if we are going to use a tool net discover to gather all the important information about the target or the network and that information will give us to launch attack it is used to explore all the clients that are connected to a system after this we will learn a tool called zenmap this tool has a better interface and is more powerful than net discover this tool is used to gather detailed information about all the target connected to the same network thank you now guys we are in the new section and in this lecture we are going to see what is net discovery so the net discovery tool is used to just gather all the important information about the network it gathers information about the connected clients and the router as for the connected clients we will be able to know their ip and mac address and the operating system as well the port that they have open in their devices as for the router it will helpful us to know the manufacture of the router so then we will be able to look for vulnerability that we can use against the client or against the router if we are trying to hack them in network penetration testing we used aerodom ng to discover all the connected devices in the second part aerodom ng output we learn how we can could how we could see the associated clients and the, and their mac addresses all these details we can get before we connected to the target access point now after connecting to the network we can gather much more detailed information about these devices so to do this task there are lot of programs but we are going to talk about two programs now start with the simplest and the quickest one which is net discover so the net discover is a quicker and the simplest program to use but it doesn't show very detailed information about the target it it will only show us their ip address mac address and sometimes the hardware manufacturer okay so we are going to use it by typing here first of all open the window make a zoom by typing here net discover okay by typing here net discover so then we are going to use hyphen r so and then we are going to specify the range which can be the range we want okay so looking at the ip address which is like 10.0.2.1 okay so this is the ip address okay so i want the full range so i'm going to add slash 24 so that we can specify whole range okay now what i'm going to do here is i'm going to hit enter so after hitting enter as you can see that it started working after some time it will take some time it will show us the related information about all the clients that are connected to that particular network so as you can see that currently scanning finish okay so don't worry it will take some time after some time it will give you results accordingly okay so it will take around 2 to 3 minutes not more than that so you have to wait till the completion of this particular program now as you can see that we have this result okay so we can see that we have three devices to the network that is connected to the network so we have their ip addresses mac address and mac vendor and host name also okay so this is the very quick and it it is very simple 
tool to just find out and gather information about the target. So this is all for this lecture. Now guys, in this lecture, we are going to see how to use ZenMap. ZenMap is a very powerful tool. So this is the graphical user, user interface. And uh, as you can see that we are having this particular logo. And when you click on this, you will find ZenMap. So click on ZenMap as rooted. So when you click on Zen map as rooted, so you will find the field here target and here we are having profile. So profile, what is profile? Profile is nothing but the type of scan that you can do with this particular uh, software or tool. So this is the target where we are, where we'll be typing the IP address of the target. So the IP address that I'm going to use here is of my meta spectral machine. Okay. So how you can find the meta spectral machine IP address, you need to simply just navigate to meta spectral machine and as same as Linux, you will type if config. So after clicking if config, you will find that just inside the body of H0, you will find the second, okay, second line 10.0.2.5. So this is the IP address of this particular machine. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to simply scan this. So when you click on this, you need to get to the profile and drop down menu. So I'm going to choose intense scan and scan, click on scan. So after clicking on scan, you will find that uh, the scanning has been started. So as you can see that what it is showing us that these many ports are open. So how it can help us uh, in finding vulnerabilities or finding exploit. Suppose that you are, you have find that the port number like 23 okay so this is open port so what you can do here is you can just simply open this port and you can take the take this port and just google the exploit for this particular port so when you find any exploit for this particular uh, port you will find the vulnerability so this is how you can use in map so it will give you very detailed information very needed information as you can see that we are having port number 21 here as you can see that this is a port number 21 which is FTP server now this is 22 and this is 23 25 so this is as you can see that all the ports are open so you can try uh, Google googling it if you find any exploit for them you can find it and you can exploit that so I will show you later that how you can exploit any open open particular port so it will be very easy for all of us to just uh, finding the open port and just find the exploit for that particular port and just gain access to that particular machine. So this is how you can use ZenMap. ZenMap is a very powerful tool. Suppose that you are using NMap. NMap is nothing but is a command line tool for just scanning or what you can say for network scanning or and finding the vulnerabilities. Okay, so if you're using NMap, you can use this particular command. Okay, so this is the command that you will, you will wanna use. Suppose that you are having this and what uh, copy and let's try to paste it so when you hit enter as you can see that the end map scanning is being started so this is how you can use this particular one in end map and this is the uh, graphical user interface so you need to only type the ip address but uh, in case of end map you need to type whole command whole command and map hyphen t4 hyphen a hyphen v this is ip address so this is how you can use both of these uh, tools for just our convenience okay so this is all for this lecture thank you for watching this lecture now guys welcome to this new section in this section we are going to start with security technologies with the rapid growth in the internet cyber security has become a major concern to organization throughout the world so the fact that the information and tool te and technology needed to penetrate the security of corporate organization Networks are widely available has increased that security concern. Today, the fundamental problem is that much of security technology aims to keep the attacker out and when that fails, the defenses have failed. Every organization who uses internet needed security technologies to cover the three primary control types, preventive, detective and corrective as well as provide auditing actually auditing and reporting most security is based on one of these types of things something we have like like we can say key or id card something we know like pin or password or something we are like fingerprint so some of important 
cyber security technologies used in cyber security are as you can see here we are having here firewall and vpn intrusion detection and access control so from the next video onwards we are going to start with firewall now guys let's start with the firewall firewall is a computer network security system designed to prevent unauthorized access to or from a private network it can be implemented as hardware software or a combination of both firewalls are used to prevent unauthorized internet users from accessing private networks connected to the internet all messages are entering or leaving the internet pass through the firewall so the firewall examines each message and block those that do not meet the specified security criteria so if we talk about the categories of firewalls so first we are having processing mode development era intended development structure deployment structure and architectural implementation okay so now let's start with the processing mode so let's start with the processing mode so the first thing that we have here is packet filtering so what is packet filtering packet filtering firewall examines header information of a data packet that comes into a network this firewall installed on tcp ip network and determines whether to forward it to the next uh, we can say whether forward to the next network connection or drop a packet based on a rules programmed in the firewall it scans network data packet looking for a violation of a rule of a firewall database so most firewalls often based on a combination of internet protocol source and destination address direction and tcp or udp source and destination port request so packet filtering firewalls can be categorized into three types so the first that we're having here is static filtering so the system administrator set a rule for a firewall these filtering rules governing how the firewall decides which packet are allowed and which are denied are dev uh, we can say are developed and installed okay so the next one is dynamic filtering it allows firewall to set some rules for itself such as dropping packets from an address that is sent uh, that is sending many bad packets then we are having a stateful inspection so what is this a stateful firewall keep track of each network connection between internal and external system using a state table okay so then we are having application gateways so what is application gateways it is a uh, we can say a firewall proxy which frequently installed on a dedicated computer to provide network security this uh, uh, proxy firewall acts as an intermediary between the requester and protected device this firewall proxy filters incoming node traffic to certain specification that means only transmitted network application data is filtered such network application includes uh, ftp telnet real time streaming protocol which is also called as rtsp and bittorrent etc okay so let's talk about circuit gateways so a circuit level gateway is a firewall that operates at the transport la layer and it provides udp and tcp connection security which means it can be resemble examine or block all the packet in a tcp or udp connection it works between a transport layer and an application layer such as a session layer unlike uh, application gateway it monitors tcp data packet handshaking and session fulfillment of firewall rules and policies it can also act as a virtual uh, private network we can say that vpn over the internet by doing encryption from firewall to firewall okay so then we are having mac layer firewalls okay so let's start with this so this firewall is designed to operate at a media access control layer of a osi network model it is able to consider a specific host computer's identity in its filtering decision mac addresses of a specific host computer are linked to the access control list which is also called as acl entries 
This entry identifies a specific type of packet that can be sent to each host and all other traffic is blocked. It will also check the MAC address of a requester to determine whether the device being used are able to make the connection is authorized to access the data or not. Then we are having a hybrid. So hybrid firewall, it is a type of firewall which combines features of all the other four types of firewalls. So these are element of packet filtering and proxy services or we can say packet filtering and circuit gateways. So now let's start with the development era. So if we talk about the development era, so firewalls can be categorized on the basics of uh, its generation, first generation, second generation and all. So now let's first start with the first generation. So now the first generation firewalls comes with a static packet filters. A static packet filter is the simplest and least expensive form of firewall protection. In this generation, each packet entering and leaving the network is checked and uh, will be either passed or rejected, depends on the user defined rules. We can compare the security with the bouncer of a club who only allows people over 21 to enter and below 21 will be disallowed. Okay, so the next one that we have here is second generation, which is also called as second gen. So second generation firewall comes with application layer or proxy servers. This generation of firewall increases the security level between trusted and untrusted networks. An application level firewall uses software to intercept connection for each IP and to perform security inspection. It involves proxy services which acts as an interface between the user on the internal trusted network and the internet. Each computer communicates with each other by passing network traffic through the proxy program. This program evaluates data sent from the client and decides which to move on and which to drop. Then we are having third generation. So, so the third generation firewall comes with the stateful inspection firewall. This uh, generation of the firewall has evolved to meet the major requirements demanded by corporate network of increasing security while minimizing the impact on network performance. And the need of this third generation firewall will be even more demanding due to the growth, uh, due to the growing, uh, we can say support, supports of VPNs, wireless communications, and we can say enhanced wireless protection. The most challenging element of evolution is maintaining the firewall simplicity and we can say the maintaining the security actually so without compromising the flex flexibility so this is very important thing to be noted down so the next one that we have here is fourth generation so the fourth generation firewalls comes with dynamic packet filters or filtering firewall this firewall monitors the state of active connections and on the basis of all this information it determines which network packet are allowed to pass through the firewall by recording session information such as IP addresses and port numbers, a dynamic packet filters can implement a much tighter security posture than a static packet filters. Last but not the least, we are having fifth generation. So the fifth generation firewalls come with the kernel proxy firewall. This firewall works under the kernel of Windows NT executor. This firewall proxy operates at the application layer. In this, when a packet arrives, a new virtual stack table is created, which contains only the protocol proxies needed to examine the specific packet. These packets investigated at each layer of stack, which involves evaluating the data link header along with the network header, transport header, session layer information and application layer data. This firewall works faster than all the application level firewalls because all evaluation takes place at the kernel layer, layer and not at the higher layer of the operating system. So now we have done with the uh, download uh, development era. Now it's time to see intended deployment structure. So firewalls can also be categorized uh, based on their structure. So first we are having here is commercial appliances it runs on a 
custom operating system you can say so this firewall system consists of firewall application software running on a general purpose computer it is designed to provide protection for a medium to large business network most of our commercial firewalls are quite complex and often require specialized training and certification to take full advantage of their feature then we are having a small office home office so what does it mean the so ho is a full form of a small office home office firewall is designed for a small office or home office network who needs protection from internet security threats a firewall for a, a small office home office is the first line of defense and plays a essential role in uh, we can say in an overall security strategy so ho firewall has limited resources so that the firewall product they implemented must be relatively easy to use and maintain and be cost effective also so this firewall connects uh, with the user local area network or specific computer system uh, to the internet networking devices then we are having here is residential software okay so residential uh, we can say great firewall software is installed directly on a user's system some of these applications combines firewall services with other protection such as antivirus or intrusion detection there are a limited to a level of configurability and protection that software firewall can provide now we are having here architectural implementation so what is architectural implementation so the firewall configuration that works best for a particular organization depends on three factors the objective of the network the organization's ability to develop and implement the structures and the budget available for the function so there are four common architectural implementation of the firewall so the first one is packet filtering routers so packet fil uh, packet filtering firewalls is used to control the network access by monitoring the outing outgoing and we can say incoming packets it allows them to pass or halt based on the source and destination ip addresses protocols or the ports and during communication a node transmits a packet this packet is filtered and matched with the predefined rules and policies once it is matched a packet is considered secure and verified and are able to accept otherwise block them then we are having here is a screen host firewall so what is this so the firewall architecture combines the packet filtering router with a separate and dedicated firewall the application gateway needs only one network interface it is allowing the router to pre uh, pre screen packets to minimize the network traffic and loads on the internal proxy so the packet filtering router filters dangerous uh, protocols from reaching the application gateway and site system now then we are having dual homed host firewall so what is this so the network architecture for a dual homed host firewall is simple its uh, architecture is built around a dual homed uh, we can say host computer a computer dash data has uh, at least two nics one nic is to be connected with the external network and the other is connected to the internal network which provides an additional layer of protection with these nics all traffic must go through the firewall in order to move between the internal and external networks so the implementation of uh, this architecture often make use of nat nat is a method of making uh, mapping assigned ip addresses to a special range of no routable internet ip addresses thereby creating another barriers to intrusion from external attackers then we are having last but not the least screen subnet firewalls so this architecture adds an extra layer of a security to the screen home host architecture by adding a perimeter network that further isolates the internal network from the internet in this architecture there are two screening router and both connected to the perimeter net one router site between the perimeter net and the internal network and the other router sides between the perimeter and the external internet go we can say network to break into the internal network an attacker would have to get pass through the both routers 
so there is no single vulnerable point that will compromise the internal network so this is all about firewalls so now let's talk about vpn so what is vpn a vpn stands for virtual private network it is a technology which creates a safe and an encrypted connection on a internet from a device to the network this type of connection helps to ensure our sensitive data is transmitted safely it prevents our connection from eavesdropping on a network traffic and allows the user to access a private network securely so this uh, technology is widely used in the corporate environment so a vpn works same as firewall like firewall protects data local to the device when wherever vpns protect data online to ensure safe communication on the internet data travel through secure tunnel and vpns users used an authentication method to gain access over the vpn servers vpns are used by remote users who need to access corporate resources consumers who want to download files and businesses uh, we can say business travelers who want to access a site that is geographically restricted so this was all about uh, we can say firewall and vpn so i hope you guys uh, uh, enjoyed it and you you will learn something from this particular lecture so thank you for watching this lecture now guys let's see last but not the least access control access control is the process of selecting restrictive access to a system it is a concept in security to minimize the risk of unauthorized access to the business or the organization in this users are granted access permission and certain privileges to a system and resources so here users must provide their credentials to be granted access to the system these credentials come in many forms such as password key card and the biometric reading etc access control ensures security technology and access control policies to protect confidential information like customer data so the access control can be categorized into two types so physical access control and logical access control so now let's talk about physical access control so physical access control this is the type of access control which limits access to buildings rooms campuses and physical id assessed and if we talk about logical access control so this type of access limits connection to computer network system files and data so the most secure method for access control involves two factor authentication so the first factor is that a user who deserve access to a system must show credential and the second factor could be access code password or a biometric reading the access control consists of two main components authorization and authentication authentication is a process which verifies that someone claims to be granted access whereas authorization provides the whether a user should be allowed to gain access to a system or denied it so this is how access control works in real world scenario now guys let's see last but not the least access control access control is the process of selecting restrictive access to a system it is a concept in security to minimize the risk of unauthorized access to the business or the organization in this users are granted access permission and certain privileges to a system and resources so here users must provide their credentials to be granted access to the system these credentials come in many forms such as password key card and a biometric reading etc access control ensures security technology and access control policies to protect confidential information like customer data so the access control can be categorized into two types so physical access control and logical access control so now let's talk about physical access control so physical access control this is the type of access control which limits access to buildings rooms campuses and physical id assessed and if we talk about logical access control so this type of access limits connection to computer network system files and data so the most secure method for access control involves two factor authentication so the first factor is that a user who deserve access to a system must show credential and the second factor could be access code password or a biometric reading the access control consists of two main components authorization and authentication authentication is a process which verifies that someone claims to be granted access whereas authorization provides the whether a user should be allowed to gain access to a system or denied it so this is how access control works in real world scenario 
hello learners how are you all i hope you guys are doing absolutely fine staying safe so in this lesson we are going to learn about http protocol so this section will be totally depends upon web technologies okay so in web in uh, web technologies the first thing is the http protocol http protocol is nothing but the hypertext transfer protocol and is a core communication protocol used to access the world wide web that is also called as www and is used by all the today's web applications and it is a simple protocol that was originally developed for retrieving static text-based responses and it has since been extended and leveraged in various ways to enable it to support the complex distribution application data now commonplace http use as a message based model in which a client sends a request message and the server returns a response message so this is just like you are asking for something and just server is reacting on that particular your request okay so the protocol is essentially uh, connectionless although http uses the stateful tcp protocol as a transport mechanism each exchange of request and response is an autonomous transaction and may use a different tcp connections so protocol this protocol is playing very important role when it comes to communication so it has three components with it the first one is http request http response and http methods so in the upcoming videos we are going to learn about all of these things separately so this is all for this video so in the upcoming videos we will be covering http request http response http methods so thank you for watching this video learners how are you all i hope you guys are doing absolutely fine staying safe so in this lesson we are going to learn about http request so what is http request all http messages contains request and response consist of one or more headers and each one is just separated by a line or followed by mandatory blank line or followed by an optional message body so the, as you can see here this is the so this is the http request kind of thing okay so this is the http request kind of thing so now let's analyze line by line what does each line means okay so let's come to the first line so let's mark it okay in the first line what you can see here there is three things first one is get second thing is just something like link and the third thing is http version okay so let's see the first thing, get what does it mean so in the first line what we can see here it is a verb indicating the http method there are two kind of methods mainly one is post and the second one is get so we will come to it later on so now it is get okay so the most commonly used method is get and whose function is to retrieve or retrieve a resource from the web server and a get request do not have a message body so on a further data follows the link like after the message header so there is nothing like uh, any kind of a message here so now you can understand what is get get is used to just retrieve data from the web server and just put it on the web page of the user and the second thing what you can see here is the request url the request url what does it mean to the request url the url typically function as a name of the resource being requested and together with the optional query string containing the parameters that the client is passing to the resource the query string is indicated by a character and the url the example contain a single parameter that uh, with the name of uid and the value of 129 so as you can see here is so this is the url okay so this is the url which is containing something in it we, we shall see later in our attacking phase so how it looks like in the case of practical thing okay so the third thing is http version this http version this uh, this parameter indicates us which version we are using uh, right now of http so currently we are using the 1.1 version the only http version common use on the internet are 1.0 or 1.1 and the most of the browser are use 1.1 by default there are few difference between the specification of these two versions however the only difference are likely to encounter when the attacking application is that the version 1.1 and the host request is mandatory okay so there are some there are some other things also so we are going to cover it all so let's see the referral header so there is the referral header here it is 
there is referral header header so what is it so referral header as the name suggesting us refer that is referring by something okay referral header is used to indicate the url from which the request originated for example because the user clicked on a link on the page note that this header was misspelled in the original http specification and the misspelled version has been retained ever since so this is how it is showing the request refer and the third thing is user agent user agent is here and the what is user agent user agent is a header used to provide information about the browser or the other client software that generated the request and note that all most all the browser or most of the browser includes a mozilla prefix for historical reason this is was the user agent and string used by originally dominant netscape browser and the other browser wanted to assert to website that they were compatible with this and the standard so as with many queries from the computing history it has become so established that it is still retained even on the current version of internet explorer uh, which made the request shown in the example okay so as you can see here mozilla okay so this is just like a historical reason this is why it is always you can see here this is because of historical reason and the third and the fourth thing is the host host is here what is host host means the host just as the name suggesting who hosting something and the host header specifies the host name that appeared in the full url being accessed and this is necessary when multiple websites are hosted on the same server because the urls run in the first line of the request usually does not contain a host name so this is how you can see here there is no host name so this host is just showing the where the request is going to okay and the last not the least thing is the cookies cookies here don't worry we will be covering all of these things later on cookies cookies as you can see here cookies so cookies uh, header is used to submit additional parameter that the server has used to the client so we shall see later what is cookies so just leave it now so this is how the http request works the first thing is get get is a http method the second thing is url and the third thing is http version okay and then we came to the then we came to the refer refer is a website from where the main website is hosted main website is referred okay then we come to the user agent user agent in which browser you are using in and the cookies which is just given to you given to the web browser by the server okay so this is how http request works so now in the next lecture we are going to see http response so now http response so in the last video we have learned about http request so in this video we are going to see what is http response so as you can see here there is number of lines here and just see number of lines here so we'll start from the beginning the first thing the first line of every http response uh, consists of three items separated by a spaces the first thing is the http version being used so this is the version that http is going to use in this request and the second thing is the numeric stat status co code indicating the result of the request and 200 is the uh, what we can say is the most common status code it means that the request has successfully and uh, the request is resources has been returned so as you can see here uh, this is 200 code okay and this is okay this is returned okay the textual reason phrase this is the textual reason phrase what we can see here and uh, further describing the status of the response and this can have uh, any value and is not used for many purpose by current browsers so this is how the first line what first line is, can, is indicating us and the second thing is the server server header contains server is here server header contains a banner indicating the web server software being used and sometimes other details such as install module and the server operating system the information contains may or may not be accurated so this is totally depends upon the developer sometimes you can see here in some website it will show you the server server name also okay so you can easily found the uh, you can easily found uh, find out the exploit of that server i will show you later how to find exploit of any server so you can use that exploit to just uh, uh, crack the things in the inside the server so this is how the server th things contain and the second the thing is the set cookies so there is i think no cookie 
yes there is no cookie but i just wanted to tell you the cookie headers issue the browser of further cookies and this is submitted back in the cookie header or subsequent request to the server and the third thing is pragma pragma is here pragma is here which is public and the pragma header instruct the browser not to store the response in it in its cache memory and the expires header indicates that the uh, response contains expired in the past and therefore should not be catched okay these instructions are frequently issued when dynamically uh, content is being returned to ensure that browser obtain a fresh version of this content on subsequent occupation okay occasion so this is how it works pragma and expire and last but not the least almost all http responses contain a message body following the blank line after the headers so the content type header indicates that the body of the major contains html documents so you can see here his content type documents so it is showing it is directly showing the http html header okay so this is how it will work and the content length will show the head indicates the length of the message body in the bytes where is content length i think it is not containing content length okay it is not having content length so this is how the http response works okay so in the upcoming videos we are going to learn about http method and url so many things so thank you for watching this video HTTP method. HTTP method. When you are attacking a web application, you will be dealing almost exclusively with the most commonly used methods, get and post. As I have talked about in my last to last video, you need to be aware of some very important difference between these methods and as they affect the application security if overlooked the get method is designed to retrieve resources it can be used to send parameters to the requested resources in the url string query okay so this enables users to bookmark a url for a dynamic resource and that they can reuse or other users can retrieve the equivalent resources on a subsequent occasion as in the url are displayed on the screen are uh, logged in the various places as uh, such as browser history and the browser server access logs they are also transmitted in the referer header to the other website when external links are followed for the reason the query string should be no should not be used to transmit any uh, sensitive information so get get that kind of request we will be performing cross-site scripting here uh, sql injection here so it will be more fun when we will doing the attacks on the get waste request so in the second thing is the post request so post request method is designed to perform actions and with this method request parameter can be sent both in the url query string and in the body of the message and although the url can still be bookmarked and any parameter sent to the board message body will be excluded from the bookmark and these parameters will also be excluded from the various locations in which logs of urls are maintained and from the referer uh, header because of the post method is designed for the performing actions if a user clicks on the browser back button to return to the uh, page that was accessed using this method and the browser does not automatically reuse the reuse the request instead it warns the user of what it is about to do as soon that the prevent user prevent user from unwillingly performing an action and more than once for this reason post request should always be used when an action being performed so when the coming it when it comes to post method we will be performing some sql injection here most in most of the thing when we type our passwords so the post method is used because it is it is more secure than the get method so the next thing is head function head function is uh, the same way as a get request so except the server should not return a message body in its response the server should return the same headers that it would have returned to the corresponding get request and hence this method can be used to check whether a resource is present before making get request for it and the other one is trace Trace is just like designed for a diagnosis purpose and the server should return this response body to the exact content of the uh, what we can say is ma request message and it received. This can be used to detect the effect of 
any proxy server between the client and the server that may manipulate the request and the other one is option option asks for asks the server to report the http methods that can available for the particular resources the server typically returns a response containing and allow headers with that particular list of label method and the put put method save an object at the location so it attempts to upload the specific resources to the server using the content contained in the body of request if the method is enabled so you can you may be able to leverage it to the attack the application as such as by uploading any arbitrary script and executing it on the server so many other http methods exist that are not directly relevant to attacking web application however a web server may ex may expose itself to attack if certain dangerous method can uh, available so we shall see later what are the methods we are going to apply for the uh, for attacking web server so this is what i am going to i was aiming to show you what is the http protocol so in the upcoming videos we will be learning about urls and uh, https and some http headers and the status course so this is all for this video thank you url url is uh, just stands for uniform uniform resource locator and a url is nothing more than the address of the given unique resource on the website and in theory each value url point points to a unique resource such resources can be an html page or sscss documents and image etc and in practice there are some exceptions the most common being a url pointing to a resource that no longer exists or that has moved as the resources represented by the url and the url itself are handled by the web server and it is up to the owner of the web server to carefully manage the resources and it associated with url so url is just a unique identifier for a web resources through which that resources can be retrieved so here is the sample url here okay so several components in this schema are optional and the port number usually is included only if it differs from the default used by the relevant protocols so the this url is just a example for you all so this is all what url is url is nothing but just a what you can see the unique identifier of any particular website okay so this is all for this video http headers so http headers supports a large number of headers so some of which are designed for a specific usable purpose some headers can be used for both request and response and other are specific to one of these message type and the following videos will describe the headers uh, you are likely to encounter when attacking web applications so there are three kinds of headers one is general second one is request and third one is response so in the upcoming videos we are going to learn about each of them in the upcoming video so let's that's all for this video in the upcoming videos we are going to see about general header thank you first in our list is general header so general header is contains so many things in it so we are going to see some specific thing the first one is connection connection tells about the other end of the communication whether it should be closed the tcp uh, connection after the http transmission has completed or it keep open the further message and the th second one is content encoding content encoding specifies the what kind of encoding is being used for the content contained in the message body and such as jzip which is used by some application to compress responses for the faster transmission so that the communication will no will not be having any kind of lag or the slowness and the third thing is content length and the content length specified the length of the message i have told you earlier message body in bytes accepted in the case of response of head requests when it indicates the length of the body in the response to their corresponding get request so the fourth thing is content type content type as we have talked it about earlier so it specifies the type of content contained in the message body such as text.html as you can see here where is content okay this is content as you can see here this is content uh, so it is having text.html so the next one is transfer encoding transfer encoding uh, which is where yes it is here so we have talked about can content encoding content type and uh, transfer encoding and 
connection okay so in transfer encoding what is what it is is if it specifies any encoding that was performed on the message body to facilitate its transfer over http and it is normally used to specify the chunk encoding when it comes to uh, employed so this is how general header this is what are the things that general encoder contain inside it so in the upcoming videos we are going to see we have completed general we are going to see request and response model okay so this is all for this video so hello learners how are you all i hope you guys are doing absolutely fine staying safe so in this lesson we are going to see a see something about request header request header is mean that you are requesting something so what kind of things will con request will contain so here is the list of the containing of the request header the first thing is accept accept tells the server what kind of content the client is willing to accept such as image type office document formats and so on so this uh, type of thing will will be we will be just uh, uh, attacking when we when it comes to the file uploading vulnerability okay and the second thing is accept encoding accept encoding means that the tells the you tells the server that kind of content encoding the client is willing to accept and the third thing is authorization authorization is just uh, it is very simple thing authorization submitted the credentials to the server for one of the built-in http authentication type and the fourth thing is cookies cookies is submit cookies to the server that the server previously issued we will be learn cookies in the upcoming videos okay don't worry about cookies and the fourth thing is host host specifies the host name that appeared in the full url being requested okay so as you can see a host this is the host and the fifth thing is if modified since so this will tell us about specifies the when the browser last received the requested response resources and if the resources has not been changed since the last time the server may in instruct the client to use uh, it catch it copy and using a response with a status code 304 we shall be learning about uh, 304 later on don't worry and uh, the next thing is if none masked and if none masked is just to specify the entity tag entity tag which is an identifier denoting the content of the message body and the browser submits the entity tag that the server is sued with the requested resources when it was last received the server can use the entity tag to determine whether the browser may use it catch it catch it copy of the responses or not okay so the next one is origin origin is just used to use in just cross domain request to indicate the domain from which the request is originated and the next one is refer refer specify the url from which the current request originated last but not the least is user agent as we have talked about it earlier so it is provide information about the browser or other client software that generated the request so this is all for this lesson so we learn about request header and the next video we are going to learn about the response header so hello learners how are you all i hope you guys are doing absolutely fine and staying safe so in this lesson we are going to learn about response header so response header contains some very important things so first thing is access control allow origin so access control allow origin is just to indicate the whether the source can be retrieved via cross domain or access request so the second thing is catchy control catchy control is just you can see here catchy control let me change the pen color yes catchy control is here so catchy control is nothing but passes catching directives to the browser and the third thing is the e tag e tag is here as you can see what is e tag e tag is specified in entity tag and client can submit this identify in future request for for the same resources in the if none masked header to notify the server which version of the resource the browser currently holds in its cache and the next one is expires expire is here okay so expire tells the browser how long the content of the message body are valid the browser may use the cache copy of the following of this resource until this time okay so the location one location where is location i think location is not is specifying here so the location is just used to redirect response okay to specify the target to the redirect okay the next one is pragma so what is pragma pragma is nothing but pragma passes uh, 
catching directives to the browser and the server provides information about the web server so as you can see here as you can see here it is yes here it is this is the web server sometimes we don't need to go for who is information gathering which we shall see later we can find the server name here so we can find the server version and server name here so we will find the exploit of this particular server and any website which i shall save with you all later so this is how we can see the server here okay the next one is set cookies set cookies is just issuing cookies to the browser that it will submit back to the server is in subsequent request and the next one is www.authenticate so what is www.authenticate so it is used to response the response that have a code status of 401 to provide details on the on the type of authentication that the server responses and the next one is x pragma options indicates whether and how the current response may be loaded within a browser frame so this is how response headers looks like so in the upcoming videos we're gonna see about cookies and the status codes so that's all for this video cookie what is cookie cookie is just a small information stored in a text file or on the user's hard drive by the web server and later used by the web browser to retrieve information from the machine and from that particular machine and instructions for reading and writing cookies are coded by website authors and executed by users browsers so cookie is nothing but cookies are the key part of the http protocol that most applications rely on and frequently they can be used as a vehicle for exploit vulnerability the cookies mechanism enable the server to send items of data to the client which the client stores and resubmits the uh, servers unlike the other type of request parameter uh, and cookies continue to be resubmitted in each subsequent request with any particular action required by the application on the user so the server issues a cookie using a set cookie response header as you have seen here yes here so this is the allocated cookies by the server and the user uh, and the user browser then autom automatically adds the following header to a subsequent uh, request back to the same server and cookies normally consist of name values pair but they may consist of any string that does not contain a space multiple cookies have can be issued by uh, using multiple set cookies header in the same server response so these are resubmitted back to the server in the same cookies header and with the semicolon spray spray separating different individual cookies and in the addition of cookies actual value the set cookies header can include any of the following optional attribute which can be used to control how the browser handle cookies so there are something about the keys is the first one is expire so when will be the cookie will expire okay the expire sets a date until which the cookie is valid and this causes the browser to say the cookie to persist in the storage and it is reused in subsequent browser session until the expiration date is reached if the attribute is not set the cookie is used only if the current browser session and the next thing is domain next thing is domain so what is domain domain specify the domain uh, for which the cookie is valid and this must be same or parent of the domain from which the cookie is received and the next thing is path path specifies the url for the path which the cookie is valid and secure if the attribute is set said the cookie will be submitted only in http request and the next one is http only if this attribute if this attribute is set the cookie cannot be directly accessed via client side javascript so this is how the cookie is working when we will be, when we will be using when we will be attacking when we will be see the our machine our vulnerable machine so we will be using cookies so many times so just keep watching the videos from starting to end we will be learning about cookies and attacks and in the next video we are going to see about status course the status course is very important when it comes to the information gathering so thank you for watching this video so hello how are you status code status code each http response message must contain a status code and it it 
in the first line it, it is in the first line indicating the result of the request and the status could fall into five groups according to the code first digit and the first to access is for the informational and informational the second two accesses the request was successful and three accesses the client is redirected to the different source and the fourth one is four accesses the request contains an error for of some kind and the fifth one is five accesses the server encountered an error fulfilling the request so this is how all these uh, stated codes mean and there are numerous specific status code menu of which are used only in specialized circumstances here are the some stated codes codes so you can most likely to encounter when attacking application along with the usable reason phrases associated with them and the first one is 100 continue and is sent in some circumstances when a client submitted a request containing a body and the response indicates that the request header were received and that the client should continue sending the body and the server returns the second response when the request has been completed so this is about 100 and the second one is 200 200 okay this is more frequently you will going to see and this indicates the request was successful and that the response body contains the result of the request and the third one is 201 so 201 is created is uh, continued in response to the put request and to indicate that the request was successful so the next one is 301 so 301 is moved permanently it redirects the browser permanently to a different url which is specified in the location header and uh, clients should use the new url new url in the future rather than original and the next one is 302 which is called and call redirect the browser temporarily to a different url and which is specified in the location header and the client should uh, revert to the original url in subsequent request and the next one is 304 304 is not modified instruct the browser to use the catch it copy of the requested resources the server uses the if uh, modified since and if none match request headers to determine whether the client has the latest version of the resources or not so the next one is 400 which is named as bad request bad request indicates that the client submitted an invalid http request so you will be probably encounter with this when you have modified a request in certain invalid ways such as by placing a space character into the url and the next one is 301 okay 401 401 so 401 is just unauthorized indicate that the server requires http authentication before the result request will be granted the www.authenticate header contains details on the types of authentication support so this is the most common one which you can see and the next one is 403 403 is just used for forbidden indicates that no one is allowed to access the requested resource regardless of authentication and the next one is 404 404 is not found this is a moan often you can see when there is no internet connection and kind of thing so not found indicates that the request resources does not exist next one is 405 405 method not allowed indicates that the method used in the request is not supported for a specified url for example you may have received uh, received this status code if you attempt to use a put method where it is not supported okay the next one is 4013 4013 request entity too large if you are probing for buffer overflow vulnerabilities in native code and therefore are submitted long string of data so this indicates that the body of your request is too large for the server to handle next one is 414 which is named as request url too long and uh, which is similar to 413 response and it indicates that url used in the request is too large larger to handle by the server and the next one is 500 500 internal server error indicates that the server encountered an error fulfilling the request so this normally occurs when you have submitted unexpected input that caused and handle error somewhere within the application processing you should closely review the full content of the server response for any detail indicating the nature of the error and the next one as 503 503 is just service unavailable 
just indicating the service and available and normally indicate that although the web server itself is functioning and can respond to request the application accessed via the server is not responding you should verify whether this is result for any action you have performed so this is all about status course hello guys welcome back to another video of this course in this video we are going to see what is brute force attack for knowing the brute force attack you need to firstly open your metasploitl machine for opening metasploitl machine you just need to open your metasploitl you have to log in into your metasploitl machine and you just need to copy the you copy the ip address of your metasploitl machine which is given in the body of at zero in the second line inet address 10.0.2.5 so this is the ip address and make sure that metasploitl machine and the kalinux should be in the same net network okay in the same net network so let's get back into our kalinux machine and now you need to enter the ip address here so after entering the ip address here you can see here our vulnerable machine is ready to use so for this attack we are going to use dvwm machine and just click on this machine so this is the dam vulnerable web application so for that you can see here i'm logged in into this machine so i'm going to show you what is the username and the password of this particular machine so the username of this dvwa is admin and the password is password so now let's click on the login and in login after login you can see this these kind of vulnerabilities you can test here for for this video i am going to show you how to brute force any particular website so before brute forcing any particular page we need to understand what is brute forcing so as you can see here this is the login page of this vulnerable machine so as you can see here when i click on this login button username is admin and the password is the password and after clicking on after clicking on login you can see here welcome to the password protected area that means you are logged in into the machine so now let's try with some other password and press enter you can see here username and your password is incorrect that's mean you entered the wrong password so what is brute forcing brute forcing is nothing but it will try each and every possible combination of characters numbers digit symbols to log in into your account if any possible combination fit right into these places then it will ultimately logged in into the account so brute forcing is nothing but forcing the numbers and characters combination into the username and the password field and after uh, after forcing it to the into these field if the combination is correct then this attack will allow you to logged in into your account so in the next video we are going to see how we can use this particular attack to log into this particular machine without knowing the password and the username of the website so this is all for this lecture hello guys welcome back to another video of this course so in this lesson we are going to perform brute force attack so in the last video we have learned that what is brute force so in this particular lesson we are going to use burp suit for performing the brute force attack so before proceeding further you just need to open your burp suit through here burp suit and after pressing enter as you can see at this kind of window will pop up in front of you so you just need to type here next and start burp when you open this first time it will take some time but don't worry it will not take so much time so before using burp suit you need to configure this burp suit with your browser so it is very important to configure your browser with the web suit so that it can intercept the request that is passing through your browser so for configuring you just need to click here in proxy and in the proxy you just need to click here in options and this is the ip address that is 127.0.0.1 and the port number is 8080 and let's remember this and cut back to your browser and search for the option or preferences here 
and now type here proxy and after typing proxy you can see the setting just click on the setting and we are going to use manual proxy so now let's type here 127.0.0.1 and the port number was 8080 so so after doing this just click on manual proxy and just click on ok so let's see it is working or not if it is not working then we will try something else so intercept is on now let's begin so as we can see here it is working properly for us so as we can see here it is intercepting so now let's try our brute force attack so for that you just need to let's forward this request okay for now let's make it off and once again let's get back to our meta exploitable machine login page so that we can easily perform this brute force attack now you can see here this is the uh, window that we are going to that in which we are going to perform the brute force attack so this is the username and this is the password so I'm going to make the intercept on so it will intercept our request and I'm going to enter wrong password like this and press enter so as you can see here it intercepted our request so the username here is admin which is correct and the password here is 1257654 and it is wrong so for that you just I am going to just send it to the intruder intruder is very powerful tool for automating the attack of any application so now as you can see here the orange tabs you just need to click on intruder and after intruder as you can see here this position in position we just need to as you can see here this these things which is in orange is highlighted by the blue thing so we just need to make them clear and we are going to perform brute force attack on username and the password so we need to add them into the scope so that we can perform the brute force attack here and we are going to make it cluster bomb cluster bomb will try the different combination of the payload so after this as you can see here that this section is the payload section and here we have two payload first one is for the username and the second one is for the uh, uh, password because we are we have add two things here one is username and the second one is password so as you can see here this is the field where we are going to type some uh, some manual some manual username and the password which is which could be correct which could not be correct uh, although there is uh, there is word list that you have to create before performing any particular brute force attack on a particular website so it will automate the process but uh, I'm going to try it manually because I know the password I know the username so for the tutorial reasons I'm going to give it give this username and the password manually so in the uh, username field because this is our payload number one I'm going to add like uh, good as a username hello admin jack the worker and wordpress hack so these many username I'm going to perform boot forcing with one two three four five six seven now it's time to add the password so in the password list you can see that we need to add some random passwords okay so for that I'm going to add like this and this like hello one hack and the correct one also password five six seven and uh, one more thing is this okay so now press enter so as you can see here 
we have successfully added the username and the password so now I am going to start the attack so so as we can see here that it the attack is going to start now so ultimately all the things all the username and the password will run in the loop as we can see here this total payload count is 8 and the request count is 56 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 and the username was 6 so uh, uh, username were also 7 I think so after multiplying 8 into 7 it will be 56 so as you can see here it is started combining the process of credentials it will take some time it depends upon the complexity of the uh, password and the username although I have used some very basic password so it will not very difficult for the a burp suit to find out the real one so as you can see here it has completed 9 out of 56 so it will take some time so you have to wait till the completion of this because it will try each and every possible combination with the username and the password so brute force attack is the very old attack and and I can make sure that if your word list is very strong so brute force attack will always work but it depends upon your computer configuration how your computers what are, what are the configurations of your computer if you have a very good computer with, with a good configuration then brute forcing will be very helpful and just breaking the password of the website so it is taking some time because I have added 7 I think username and the 8 is a password so for till the completion of this I am going to pause the video and after this I am going to restart the video again after so long finally it ended so now let's see what it has for us so as we can analyze this so these many are the possible combinations of the uh, what we can say username and the password so it will be very difficult for you that if you have a great long word list so how you can identify you cannot manually try each and every one with every combination in your login section so for that you just need to find the odd one in the length section let's get down we can see here as you can see 4885 so now let's get see which one is different so as you can see here 4951 is the different one which is admin and the password so now let's try with this and see it will work for us or not as you can see here it is working so this is how brute force attack works and this is how you can perform brute forcing on any particular website thank you for watching this lecture if you have any doubt so you can ask me hello guys welcome back to another brand new section of this course in this section we are going to see what is xss which is also called as cross-site scripting so now let's learn about xss so this type of vulnerability allows an attacker to inject javascript code into a page and javascript is a programming language and using this vulnerability an attacker would be able to execute code written in javascript into a certain page such as website javascript is a client side language so when the code is executed it will be executed on the client side on the user the person who is browsing the web page it is not going to execute it on the server so even if our code result in us getting a reverse cell the cell will be coming from the user who is browsing the page not from the website so any code we write in javascript will be exploited or will run on the target user and on the people who see the web page and not on the web server 
So the web server is only going to be used as a mean of executing or delivering the code. So there are three types of accesses. The first one is stored based, second one is reflected and the third one is DOM based. So if we talk about persistence or stored based accesses, get it stored into the database and the code that we will inject will be sort stored in the database or the page so that every time any person will view the page that code will execute and the, this kind of vulnerability will appear in front of the user. Next one in our list is reflected. With reflected accesses, the code will only be executed when the target user runs a specific URL that is crafted or written by us. So we will be manipulating some sort of URL and sending it to the target. And when the target runs the URL, the code will be executed. Last but not the least, DOM based. DOM based accesses results from JavaScript code that is written on a client side. So the code will actually be intercepted and run on the client side without having any communication with the web server. This could be very dangerous because sometimes web server applies security and filtration measure to check for accesses. But in DOM based accesses, the code never gets sent to the web server. This means that the code will be interpreted and run on the web browser without even interacting with the web server and will be present in the website that updates their content without refreshing. We have all used websites where we enter our username for example and it loads and is straight away without having to check with the web server or perhaps we enter some sort of string and it performs a search without communicating with the web server. Whatever the process, some websites perform functions without communicating with their web server. If we are able to inject these kinds of uh, codes in the website, then such injection will not be validated and they will be executed straight away and bypass all the validation. In the next video, we are going to see how to perform reflected accesses. So this is all for this lecture. In this lecture, we are going to see what is reflected accesses attack. Reflected accesses attack is the most common attack is the most common vulnerability that you can find on any particular website. So reflected accesses attack are those where the injected script is reflected off the web server such as in an error message, search result or any other response that includes some or all of the inputs sent to the server as a part of the request. Reflected attacks are delivered to victims via another route such as in an mail message or on some other website. When a user is tricked into clicking on a malicious link, submitting a specially crafted form or even just browsing to a malicious site, the injected code travels to the vulnerable website, which reflects the attack back to the user's browser. The browser then executes the code because it came from the trusted server, reflected accesses is also sometimes referred to as a non-persistence or type second accesses. So in the next video, we will be going to see how to attack reflected accesses. Hello guys, welcome back to another video of this section. In this section, we are going to see how to perform cross-site scripting. And in this particular video, we will be seeing how to find out reflected accesses from website and how to attack reflected accesses on any particular website. So for that, we need to open our Metasploitful machine and in Metasploitful you can, you will see this accesses reflected. So just click on this as you can see this kind of interface. So what it is asking for? This is asking for what is your name? Okay, it is asking for my name. So I'm going to give it Devakar Parihar and press enter. So after pressing enter, let's see the behavior of this page. It is reflecting Devakar Parihar. Whatever I'm writing here, it is reflecting here. Let's say hello. So as we can see here, it is reflecting hello. Now let's try with 
hello debugger and press enter so as you can see here it is reflecting each and everything what i am writing here so this is giving us basic idea that this website can contain reflected xss and let's see this parameter with this name parameter here is a hello and the worker is also reflecting here so now let's try with some very basic javascript code so that it will ensure that it is working as or not so for that you need to type a script hello and hello and close the string and a script and press enter so as we can see here this website containing reflected xss inside it and this is showing us whatever we are writing here it is reflecting in just front of us so this is saying that hello let's suppose if i add the link here that click just like this just like this uh where is my okay this is the code okay so now i will type click on this link and i will provide the link below like i will provide here the link and the link will be containing malware so after clicking on that particular link the malware ultimately downloaded and it will automatically install into the user system so it will be very harmful for the user for just clicking on that particular link so this is how you can get reflected xss so and most of the time we don't have source code but in this particular website we are having source code so we are going to see what source code doing here as you can see here a reflected xss source in this it is asking for the name okay as you can see here there is nothing for filtering our javascript code that means it is not it is not filtering anything inside our whatever i am writing here so this is how you can find reflected xss in the next video we are going to see if any filter is working here so how we can exploit javascript code this is all for this lecture in the last video we have seen that how to exploit reflected xss when there is no filter in the website so now let's increase the security and let's see it will work for us or not okay so now let's click on the xss reflected tab and let's try with the hello let's see it is working or not so as you can see here it is reflecting whatever i'm writing here so now let's try with our previous code which is this and press enter so as you can see here alert click on this link that means it is reflecting a scripting tag understand now let's try with simpler one a script alert uh alert one script and press enter so as i can see here it is reflecting our script tag here okay so what we can do here so for this reason for the tutorial reason that i'm teaching you how to find how to exploit this kind of vulnerability when there is reflect when there is filtering something so in this case now let's see the source uh, source code what it is reflecting so as you can see here this hello replace a script with null character as you can see here null character it is replacing a script with null character okay i know it is it is just uh, filtering my script so what i can do here is i will script alert 
to script presenter so as you can see here this payload is working for us so this is how you can trick the website by using some other uh, tricky codes tricky payloads so what i did with this so now let's see this again now let's make it capital and make this script also capital let's try with this so it is also working so what i did i did nothing i just as we as we have saw in this particular source code that it is only reflecting the simple script a script it doesn't matter it is a uh, capital or uh, smaller this is just uh, if uh, this is just filtering the smaller letters okay smaller letters so what i did is i changed the s into capital and the rest of all the alphabets i script alert one script so now it is working for us so this is how your creativity can make you uh, can make uh, work very easy for you all so if you are wondering that how i can how, how i can know all these payloads so you don't need to learn javascript so for that you need to just get to this particular website here you will find most of the accesses payloads so that it will make your work very easy during the exploitation phase so this is all for this lecture this is the link you just need to type in the browser xss payload and press enter here you will find the first link which is github.com so this is all for this lecture thank you for watching this video so now let's see what is a stored based xss attack stored bit xss attack are those where the injected script is permanently stored on the target servers such as in a database in a message form visitor log comment field etc the victim then retrieves the malicious script from the server when it requests the stored information the stored xss is also sometimes referred to as persistence or type 1 xss so as we have seen in reflected accesses that whatever we code run on a particular website this is for the client side and only user only that user can access that particular code in which the link the code is there but in case of a stored base the code that we inject in a web page it will stored in a server side and whenever any user came across with that particular website then it will reflect to them any user because it is stored in a server side and in the next video we are going to see how to inject malicious code in a website and make it stored based xss so now in this particular lesson we are going to see how to perform stored based xss so for that we need to get to the xss stored and let's check the security it is on medium let's make it low and sum it and get back to access as stored so as you can see this page so this is asking for the name so i am going to enter name and the message hello everyone and i am going to just press enter so now let's see what it will do so as you can see here this is printing name with message here in this so what is uh, what makes stored based xss different from xss which is reflected based so that so now firstly we need to try it is containing uh, any kind of vulnerability or not for that we need to run our javascript code here so let's see it will work or not so this is the most basic java script payload so as you can see here as you can see here 
when whatever I try to write, it is not allowing me to write more than one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten characters. So what I will do, I will just write my name here, and I will get back to this here. A script I will try here because this is the message body. So here there will be no filter okay so now let's try with this as you can see here here this is properly working okay so what makes different between reflected and stored base so now let's see I am in file inclusion okay so now when I get back to the stored based this is reflecting that means this website contains stored based accesses whenever I get back to this particular page it will execute that code that I have right on the message body and this will reflect this particular message box here but in case of reflected accesses what it is so now let's run this code and it is uh, reflecting but whenever I get to this page and whenever I get back to get back to this page this is nothing here is nothing that means this is for the client side the particular user and if I get back to accesses stored it is reflecting me that means the particular code has been stored into the web server of this particular page so this is how in a low setting stored accesses work in the next video i'm going to show you how to just bypass the filter of 10 character how we can write more than 10 character and execute our command here so this is all for this lecture so in this lecture we are going to see how to bypass this particular filter so for that what i will do i will go to the setup so that it will make this particular page new it will clear all the database and it will create new database for us so now when i get back to the this page it will not show any kind of stored based accesses to make the security level to medium and let's try with stored accesses okay here as you can see here it is not allowing us to write character more than 10 in the last video we performed our stored accesses in this field but in this uh, video we are not going to use this field because we are going to use this field okay so for that what i will do i will just type a script okay a script alert okay not alert the 10 letter the 10 character i think it's completed so what i will do i will go to the inspect element and in inspect element you can see that this field input name text name okay i'm here type text size 30 max length is equal to 10 so what i will do i will make some changes and make it 200 and press enter now what i can do yes i can write more than 10 characters so i will run alert hmm is is script and press and let's write something here code is correct now let's try so as you can see here it is not showing me the stored based accesses pop-up so what it is doing i think it is filtering our script tag so once again what i will do here is script alert i will make s as a capital and let's make this to the to 10 to 100 and let's try with this okay i will make s to capital 
S to capital and write something here. Shoe R fact. Okay, now let's try with this. So as we can see here, this payload is working for us. So what what is the complexity of this particular website? So now let's get back to the view source. It will show us how the website developer thinks. So as we can see here, uh, send a message input message string my space. Okay, so this is the function str replace which is replacing a script tag into the null okay so this is how it is filtering our script tag so that's why we use capital s here so this is how with the little bit creativity you can perform stored based accesses and reflected accesses so this is all for this section I hope you guys guys understand what is cross site scripting what is reflected accesses what is stored based accesses so hello in this lesson we are going to see what is file upload vulnerability file upload vulnerability plays very important role when it comes to the security of web server so file upload vulnerability are a major problem with the web based applications and in many web servers this vulnerability depends entirely on purpose that allows an attacker to upload a file hiding malicious code inside that can then be executed on the server and an attacker might be able to put a pissing page into the website or deface the website an attacker may be reveal internal information of web server to others and some chances to sensitive data might be informal by unauthorized people and if we talk about dwa dwa the web page allows users to upload an image the web page to through the through this program coding and check if the last character of the file is j dot jpg or jpeg or png uh, before allowing the image get uploaded in the directory so this is how file probability it is and in the upcoming videos we want to see what is file probability and how we can exploit it thank you so hello welcome back to another video of this course in this lesson we want to see how to just find out file upload vulnerability on a particular website and how to exploit it so let's see here in our dvw machine so let's get to the upload section so as you can see this website allows us to upload something so let's go to the browse and i'm going to upload this bike photo and just press on upload so as you can see here so this is the path where this file is uploaded so let's see it is uploaded on server on our server or not just copying this copying this link and just paste it here just press enter so as you can see it is uploaded on our server so let's get back here so as you can see here the code in the code there is no filter is here okay so you can upload anything so i'm going to upload php cell here php cell how you can upload php cell here so let's create a php cell here. so I cell here so i'm going to use a tool named wavely so let's see how it works just click wavely and it will show you how you can take use of this tool so as, as you can see error to run time error and if you want to generate new agent that is new file then you should use this command so let's try this command wavely okay generate and you have to put password here so i'm going to put 1234 and the path where you want to save the file i'm i want to save it on desktop and just name the file okay and dot php okay php just press enter so you can see here the file is saved on our desktop so this is the file so let's just back to our machine let's try to inject let's try to upload it desktop and where is php cell open so now click on upload and it is successfully uploaded so if you want to see it is uploaded or not just copy the path just paste it here paste it here and just press enter so as you can see here the blank screen so let's try with wavely it is uploaded or not so as you can see here if you want to just uh, 
make handshake with this Waverly. So this command you should use Waverly, and you have to put the URL URL of the uploaded file. Control O, Control C. Let's paste it here and the password one two three four. Let's press enter. So as you can see here you are connected with the file. Now you do now you what you can do whatever you want to do here. So I'm going to use Linux command here. So let's see where I am. PWD. So I am in currently in this directory. So let's see list. So these are the things which it's which is in my desktop. So if you want to see so these are the things that is showing here. So now let's see the ID. Now let's see the U name. So that is Linux Metasploitable Machine. If you want any kind of help from Wavely, let's press help and press enter. So these many commands you can use. So this is how you can exploit the vulnerability. So thank you. Show. Sure. On the last video, we have managed to upload our PHP cell here. So now let's try by increasing the security. So it is medium and just summit. So as you can see here, we just made the security to medium and let's try to upload that particular shell here. Okay. So we are the cells here it is and just open and just click on upload. So it is showing me that header already sent. So it is showing me the warning and it is asking for me to upload image. So let's try to upload image that it is taking image or not. Let's see. Let's enter upload. So yes, it is accepting image. So let's try some black box methods. So first of all, we have to see the source code if it is available then it's your luck if it is not then you can use black box texting so as you can see here it is just allowing us to upload only image jpg jpeg type files so let's try so first of all we have to see which kind of in which kind of request it is it is post based request so we have to open our burp suit so that we can intercept the request and then we will modify it later on just click on the burp suit so it is opening so as you can see here it will take some time to just open so before doing this so as you can see here it is not taking dot php so we have to make some changes here now we have to just rename it so jpg and press enter so it is now jpg file okay so now let's get back to our machine and burp suit burp suit is opening and it's just in front of us we start burp okay so before starting it just make it to close just make it to manual okay understand and then get back to our burp suit so as you can see here it is just starting up this is very powerful tool so just go to proxy intercept is on and let's upload the file again here is desktop cell.jpg press enter so it is intercepted our request so as you can see here so this is our cell.jpg and let's try to make some changes here I will name it cell.2 because in the last we have loaded so as you can see here content type only these two things can be acceptable here okay so I will change it to PHP let's see how it's gonna work forward the request let's see it is uploaded or not voila it is uploaded so this is how you can upload any particular file on a, part, on a particular website if it is filtering something so you can just use this kind of technique it depends upon your mind and your creativity okay so now this is all for this video 
and one more thing one more thing if you want to just start if you want to just start contacting with this if you want to just contacting with the server so you have to see it forward okay let's copy the url and let's open waveley paste the url here and just password 1234 press enter so you can see where our waveley started so now you can do whatever you want to do you can run you can just run any linux command here so this is what i want to taught try to teach you and thank you so guys welcome to the new section in the section we are going to talk about security policies that we have inside cyber security and that are very important to implement so security policies are a formal set of rules which is issued by an organization to ensure that the user who are authorized to access company technology and information assessed comply with rules and guidelines related to the security of information it is a written document in the organization which is responsible for how to protect the organizations from threat and how to handle them when they will not uh, when they will occur actually and a security policy also considered to be a living document and which means that the document is never finished but it is continuously updated as requirements of the technology and employment changes so this is the introduction about it in the next lecture we are going to see the need of security policies now guys let's see what is the need of cyber security policies so it increases the efficiency so the best thing about having a policy is being able to increase the level of consistency which saves time money and resources the policy should inform the employees about their individual duties and telling them what they can do and what they can not do with the organization sensitive information second thing is it upholds discipline and accountability when any human mistakes will occur and system security is compromised then the security policy of the organization will back up any disciplinary action and also supporting a case in a court of law the organization policies act as a contract which be proves that an organization has taken a step to protect its intellectual property as well as its customer and clients third thing it it can make or break a business deal it is not necessary for company to provide a copy of their information security policies to the other vendors during a business deal that involves the what we can say transference of their sensitive information it is true in a case of bigger business which ensures their own security interests are protected when dealing with the smaller businesses which have less high end security systems in place then we are having it helps to educate employees on security literacy a well written security policy can also be seen as an educational document which informs the readers about their importance of responsibility in protecting the organization sensitive data it involves on choosing the right password to providing guidelines for each transfer each file transfer actually and data storage which increases employees overall awareness of security and how it can be strengthened and we use security policies to manage our network security most types of security policies are automatically created during the installation we can also customize policies to suit our specific environment there are some important cyber security policies recommendation so what are them so the first one is virus and spyware protection policy so this policy provides the following protections like we can say it helps to detect uh, and remove and repair the side effect of viruses and security risk by using signatures it also helps to detect the threat in the file and which is the uh, which the user try to download by using reputation data from download insights and it can also help to detect applications that exhibit suspicious behavior by using sonar heuristic and reputation uh, we can say reputation data and the next thing we are having here is firewall policy so how it can help us so this policy provides the uh, for we can say uh, it blocks unauthorized user 
and it detects the attacks by cyber criminals and it removes the unwanted sources of network traffic then we are having intrusion prevention policy so this policy automatically detects and blocks the network attack and browser attack it also protects application from vulnerabilities it checks the contents of one or more data packages and detects malware which is coming through legal ways then we are having live update policy so this policy can be categorized into two types one is live update per kind of content policy and the other one is live update setting policy so live update policy contains a setting which determines when and how client customer download the content updates from live update we can define the customer data client um, we can say the client's contact to check for update and schedule when and how often client's customer check for update next one is application and device control so this policy protects the system resources from application and manages the peripheral devices that can attach to a system so this uh, device control policy applies to both windows and mac computers whereas application control policy can be applied only to windows client actually then we are having exceptions policy so this policy provides ability to exclude applications and uh, we can say processes for detection by the virus and spyware scans then we are having at the end host integrity policy so this policy provides ability to define enforce and restore security of client computer to keep enterprises network and data secure we can use this policy to ensure that client is computer whose access our network whose access to our network are protected and we can say compliance with companies security policies and the policy this policy requires that the client system must have installed antivirus so this was all about the security policies so it is very important to take care of security policies update them and uh, add the points according to the requirements and current uh, uh, working of it so this is all about this lecture thank you for watching this lecture hi guys welcome to the new lecture or we can say new section in this section we are going to start with the security standards so to make cyber security measures explicit the written norms are required these norms are known as cyber security standards so the generic sets of prescription for an ideal execution of certain measures the standards may involve methods guidelines reference frameworks etc it ensures efficiency of security facilitates integration and uh, we can say interoperability enable uh, enables the meaning we can also say comparison of measures reduces complexity and provides the structure of new developments a security standard is a published specification that establishes a common language and contain a technical specification or other precise criteria and is designed to be used consistently as a rule as a guideline or as a definition the goal of security standard is to improve the security of information technology systems networks and critical infrastructures the known written cyber security standards enable consistency among product developers and serves as a reliable standards for purchasing security products security standards are generally provided for all organizations regardless of their size or the industry and sector in which they operate this section includes information about each standard that is usually recognized as an essential component of any cyber security strategy now guys let's start with the iso so what is iso iso stands for international organization for standardization international standards make things to work these standards provide a world class specification for product services and computers to ensure quality safety and efficiency they are instrumental in facilitating international trade iso standards is officially established on 23rd fab 1970 47 actually not 74 it's 47 and it is an independent non government international organization today it has a, a membership of 162 national standards bodies and 784 technical committees and subcommittees to take care of standard development iso has published over 
22,336 international standard and its related document which covers almost every strand, uh, every industry actually every industry from uh, information technology to food safety to agriculture and to healthcare also so now let's we are going to see ISO 27000 series which is very important to learn okay so before going to it we need to first understand what is uh, uh, 20000 uh, 27000 series it is a family of information security standard which is developed by the international organization for standardization and the international electro what you can say uh, electro technical commission to provide a globally recognized framework for best information security management it helps the organization to keep their information assessed secure such as employee details financial information and intellectual property the need of iso 27000 series arises because of the risk of cyber attacks which the organization face the cyber attacks are growing day by day making hackers a constant threat to any industry that uses technology so the ISO 27000 series uh, can be categorized into many ways. So let's start with this, which is ISO 27001, which is very difficult to pronounce actually. Okay, so this standards allows us to prove the client and stakeholders of any organization to managing the best security of these confidential data information actually. And this standards involves a process based approach for establishing, implementing, operating, monitoring maintaining and improving our ISMS actually so the next one is ISO 27000 so this standard provides an uh, explanation of terminologies used in ISO 27001 then we are having ISO 27002 so what is this this standards provide guidelines for organization information security standards and information security management practices it includes the sections implementations of op operating and management of controls taking into consideration the organization is informing uh, information security risk environments then we are having iso 27005 so this standard supports the general concept is specified in 27001 it is designed to provide the guideline for uh, implementation of uh, implementation of you can say information security um, based on a risk management approach to completely understand ISO uh, 27005 the, the knowledge of the concepts models processes and terminology described in ISO 27001 and 27002 is required this, this standard is capable for all kind of organizations such as non-government organization government agencies and commercial enterprises then we are having at the last ISO 27032 so this is little bit easy as compared to the 27001 and 2 okay so what is ISO 27032 so it is an international standard which uh, focuses explicitly on cyber security this standard includes guidelines for protecting the information beyond and uh, beyond the borders of an organization such as in collaboration partnerships or other information sharing arrangement uh, the client and the suppliers has so this is all about iso in the next lecture we are going to talk about it act then we will be talking about copyright act and patent law and ipr there is a lot of thing to know and learn about so this is all for this lecture now guys let's see what is it act so the information technology act known also known as ita 2000 or the it act main aim is to provide the legal infrastructure in india which deals with cyber crimes and e-commerce the it act is based on the united nations model law on e-commerce 1996 recommended by the general assembly of united nations this act is also used to check misuse of cyber network and computers in india it was officially passed in 2000 and uh, abandoned in 2008. It has been designed to give the boost to electronic commerce and e-transaction and related activities associated with the commerce and trade. It also facilitates electronic governance by means of reliable electronic records. IT Act 2000 has 13 chapters, 94 sections and 4 schedules. So the first 14 section concerning digital signature and other section deals with the certifying authorities who are licensed to issue 
digital signature certificates and section 43 to 47 provides uh, penalties and com compensations actually and sections 48 to 64 deals with appeal to high court and section 65 to 79 deals with offenses and the remaining sections 80 to 94 deals with miscellaneous of this act then we are having copyright act so what is copyright act the copyright act 1957 amended by the copyright amendment act 2012 governs the subject of copyright law in india this act is uh, act applicable for from 19 from 1958 21st january copyright is a legal term which describes the ownership of control of the right to the author of uh, original work of authorship actually so that that are fixed uh, in the tangible form of expression and an original work of authorship is a distribution of certain works for of creating expression including books videos movies music and computer programs the copyright law has been uh, we can say enacted to balance the use and reuse of creative works against the desire of the creator of art, uh, literature, music and monetize their work by controlling who can make and sell copies of the work. So, Copyright Act covers right to copyright owner, work eligible for protection, duration of copyright, who can claim copyright. So, the Copyright Act does not cover the following things like ideas, procedures, methods, process, concept, system, principle or discoveries works that are not fixed in the tangible form familiar symbols or design titles names short phrases and slogans and uh, we can say so many things so now let's talk about what is patent law so what is patent law patent law is a law that deals with new inventions traditional patent law protect tangible uh, scientific inventions such as circuit boards heating coils car engines or zippers as time increases, patent law have been used to protect a broader variety of inventions such as business practices, coding algorithms or, or we can say genetically modifying organisms. It is the right to exclude others from making, using, selling, importing uh, in, or we can say inducing others to infringe and offering a product especially uh, adapted for practices of the patent. So in general, a patent patent is a right that we can grant it if uh, an invention is not a natural object or process. The object should be new, useful, and not obvious. Then we are having IPR. So what is IPR? Intellectual property right is a right that allows creators or owners of patents, trademarks, or copyright copyrighted works to benefit from their own plans, ideas, or other uh, intangible assets or investment in a creation these ipr rights are outlined in article 27 of the national uh, universal declaration of human rights and uh, it provides for the it uh, actually provides for the right to benefit from the protection of moral and material interest resulting from authorship of scientific literacy or artistic protection these property right allows the holder to exercise a monopoly on the use of the item for a specified period. So this was all about security standards. I hope you guys understand it. In the, from the next lecture onwards, we are going to start with the digital signatures. So thank you for watching this lecture. Now guys, let's start with the dig digital signature. Here we are inside the new section and we are going to start with the digital signature. So now let's talk about it. So what is a digital signature? So, digital signature is a mathematical technique which validates the authenticity and integrity of a message, software or digital documents. It allows us to verify the author name, date, time of signature and authenticate the message contents. The digital signature offers far more inherent security and intended to solve the problem of tampering and we can say uh, intentionally copy, copy another person characteristic in digital communication. The computer-based business information authentication interrelate both technology and the law. It also calls for cooperation between the people of different professional and uh, backgrounds and areas of expertise. The digital signature are different from other electronic signature, not only in terms of process and result, but also it, takes, it makes digital signature 
more uh, serviceable for legal purposes simultaneous signatures that uh, legally recognizable as signatures may not be secure as digital signature and may lead to uncertainty and dispute so in the next lecture we are going to see the applications of digital signatures so guys in this lecture we are going to talk about the applications of digital signatures so now let's start with this so the first thing that we have here is authentication authentication is a process which verifies the identity of a user who wants to access the system in the digital signature authentication helps to authenticate the source of messages then we are having non repudiation 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 actually <laughs> okay so non repudiation uh, means assurance of something that cannot be denied it as uh, it ensures that someone to a contract or communication cannot later deny the authenticity of their signature on a document or in a file or the sending of message that they originated then we are having integrity so integrity ensures that the message is real accurate and safeguarded from unauthorized users modification during the uh, transmission so this is all about the applications of this so now let's talk about the um, we can say algorithm in digital signature how what kind of algorithm is used inside it so if we talk about the algorithm the digital signature consists of three algorithms the first one is the key generation algorithm so the key generation algorithm is select private key randomly from a set of possible private keys and the algorithm provides the private key and its corresponding public key then we are having signing algorithm a signing algorithm produces a signature for a document then we are having signature verifying algorithm so signature verifying algorithm either accept or reject the document's authenticity so this is how it uh, contains these kind of uh, algorithm inside digital signature in the next lecture we are going to talk about the working of digital signature how does it work so guys in this lecture we are going to see digital signatures type so before talking about types of digital signature first we have to understand how does it work how digital signature works so digital signatures are created and verified by using public key cryptography also known as asymmetric cryptography by the use of a public al public key algorithm such as rsa one can generate two keys that are mathematically linked one is a private key and another one is a public key so the user who is created the digital signature uses their own private key to encrypt the signature related to document and there is only one way to decrypt that document is the use of signature or public keys okay so this technology requires all the parties to trust that the individual who created the signature has been uh, able to keep their private key secret if someone has accessed the singer's uh, we can say the singer's private key okay so there is a possibility that they could create fraudulent signatures in the name of private key holder so the steps which are followed in creating a digital signatures we can say that the first one is selecting a file to be digitally signed then the hash value of the message or file content is calculated this message of file content is encrypted by using a private key of a sender to form the digital signature then then now the original message or the file content along with the digital signature is transmitted then after the receiver decrypts the digital signature by using a public key or a send of a sender and then the receiver who now has the message or file content and can compute it then comparing these computed message or file content with the original computed message the comparison needs to be same for ensuring integrity now let's talk about the types of digital signatures so the first one that we have here is certified signature so the certified digital signature documents displays a unique uh, blue ribbon across the top of the document and the certified signature content the name of the document singer and the certificate issuer which indicates the authorship and authenticity of the document then we are having approval signature so the uh, the approval digital signature on a document can be used in an organization's business workflow they help to optimize the organization's approval procedure the procedure involves or we can say the procedure that involves capturing uh, approvals made by us and other individuals and embedding them into the pdf document 
and the approval signature to include details such as image of our physical signature location date and official seals then we will have then we will be having visible digital signature so the visible digital signature allows a user to sign a single document uh, digitally so this signature appears on a document in the in the same way as signature are signed on a physical document then we are having invisible digital signature so the invisible digital signature carries a visual indication of a blue ribbon within a document in the task bar we can use invisible digital signature when we do not have or do not want to display our signature but need to provide the authenticity to the doc of the document its integrity and its origin so this is all about digital signature that you want to that uh, that is needed to learn in cyber security so thank you for watching this lecture generating secure password this is very important to generate secure password and complex password so in this video i am going to share with you all some guidelines for setting secure password choosing the right password is something that many people find difficult there are so many things that requires password these days that remembering them all can be a real problem perhaps because of this a lot of people choose their password very badly the simple tips below are intended to assist you in choosing a password a good password or a strong password so the basic tips are use at least 8 characters the more characters the better really but most people will find anything more than about 15 word difficult to remember use a random mixture of characters upper and lower case number punctuation spaces and the symbols and do not use a word found in a dictionary english or a foreign or any any other place use the password that you can remember and that is complex enough to break never use the same password twice because if someone hack into your password if someone is managed to get your password then if you make the same password for all the website then it will be very easy for that particular person to hack to get into your accounts online accounts now the thing is there are some things that uh, you all should avoid during making the secure password or generating the password so the first thing is don't just add a single digit or symbol before or after a word example apple one because in according to you it will make it secure but it is not secure when someone try to do a uh, brute force attack or dictionary attack it will be very easy for them to break it and don't develop a single word don't simply reverse a word don't just remove the vowel because there are many tools which are very complex and very good at the password cracking if you make this kind of password then this will very easy for them to break key sequence that can easily be repeated example query so these are the things that you all should avoid making the password and the tips are choose a password that you can remember so that you don't need to keep looking it up and this reduces the chance of somebody discovering where you have written it down and choose a password that you can type quickly this reduces the chance of somebody discovering your password by looking over your shoulder so this is all about how you can make passwords and if you see that uh, what are the bad password if you ask me what are the what kind of passwords are bad so don't use password based on personal information such as name nickname birth wife's name pet names friend name hometown phone number social security number car registration number address etc that kind of things this include using just part of your name or part of your birth date and don't use password based on things located near you password such as computer monitor keyboard telephone printer smartphone anything that is near to you and don't ever be tempted to use one of those oh so common passwords so that easy it will be very easy to break the passwords like password let mine these kind of passwords are very common never use password based on your username account name or computer name or email address so this is all about password generation now in this section we are going to talk about what are the certificate that you can do to boost your career cyber attacks are a fast growing crime in us and rest of the world they continue to grow in size and sophistication companies like facebook uber under armor made headlines after having customers information stolen with each breach administrative fears and the demand of security certifications increase these fears are not unfounded 
Centrify found that 66% of customers in US would like to halt any interaction with a business that is officially been hacked. As a company, you might find yourself scrambling to hire top security talent or equip your IT team with cybersecurity certifications. As an IT professional, the demand for cybersecurity skills presents a huge opportunity to boost your resume and stand out among candidates and increase your earning potentially. The first one in our list is Certified Ethical Hacker that is also called as CEH. To stop a hacker, you must be able to think like one. It is an interesting balance between towing the line of moral action and processing the malicious thoughts the average criminal would have. This kind of mentality isn't easy to come by. This certificate teaches you the skills you need to think and act like a hacker. CEH students go through a real-time scenario where they are exposed to different ways hackers pen penetrate into network and steal information. Students learn how to scan, test and hack and protect their systems. IT professionals who complete these certifications have many positions to choose from. The most notorious being penetration testing. Penetration testing job requires you to hack into a network without actually stealing any data. This job action demands a high level of trust, which is well rewarded. Penetration tester salary often top out at just over $130,000 annually according to pay scale. So, the certification, CA certification benefits security officers, auditors, security professionals, and site administrators, and any anyone concerned about network infrastructure security. Comsa Security Plus is a base level certification for IT professionals who are new to cybersecurity. You only need two years of IT experience to complete it. The Comsa Security Plus certification is regarded as a general cybersecurity certification because it does not focus on a single vendor product line. In this certification, you will learn about broader IT security concepts including network attack strategy and defenses, element of effective security policies, network and host based security best practices, business continuity and disaster recovery, encryption standards and products. Comcia Security Plus is great for anyone looking to gain basic IT security knowledge. Certified Information System Security Professional that is also called as CISSP. Another popular certification for general security knowledge is the Certified Information Security System Security Professional Certification. Many IT companies consider CISSP a base requirement for employee responsible for network security. This certificate challenges you in various cybersecurity domains including access control, cryptography, telecommunications, networking. Like Comcia Security Plus, this certification is not vendor specific. So the knowledge can be applied to a variety of setups. To take this exam, you need at least three to five years of field experience. The CISSP is considered the crown jewel of cybersecurity certifications and passing the exam can lead to some incredible lucrative position. Security architects, for example, you can make more than one lakh fifty thousand dollars annually. The CISSP certification is must have for people looking to move into a Chief Information Security Officer CISO role. But it is also a salary booster for analysts, systems engineers, consultants, and IT security managers. So as a conclusion, these top cybersecurity certification will keep your IT staff up to date on the latest technology, techniques, and cybersecurity best practices or help elevated your income and marketability. But being cybersecurity aware is not only for IT professionals. All business staff should have a foundation understanding of cybersecurity and make the risk technology process. So why are not more IT professionals investing in these skills? The biggest hurdle to Earning a cybersecurity certification is time. Whether you prefer instructor led or online earning, New Horizons can provide the right cybersecurity training experience for you all. So doing any certification if you don't have knowledge, it will not help you in your career.